All right, it looks like we're recording. There's no Zoom lady to go. <laughs> recording Reco- now. Recording and pro- re- whatever. I don't think I say- would have memorized her one line by now. I- I'm pretty sure she says the two words, recording now. No? No, I don't think so. Recording, recording now. in progress. Recording now. Recording in progress. <laughs> Is that wrong? Eva, what does know. Zoom say? Eva? <laughs> what the hell does Eva? she say? Are you Where gaslighting are you? me, Christine? I feel pretty Text confident. Recording, recording in now. progress. No way. Yes. Recording in progress. You don't hear it? I'm so good at it. Well, now it's... T- Hold on. Do it again. One more time. Recording in progress. Oh, my God. I'm on Zoom by accident. Hang on. I got to <laughs> switch over. <laughs> it sounds like we just hit recorded eight times and just kept stopping it which also is entirely possible because we have done that before um christine look at you and your little tie-dye what's the vibe okay. here's what's happening there's so many things happening i got a new I want webcam all the, all the updates okay can you see me okay yeah okay i got a new webcam it's supposed to be like 4k and like really fancy mm-hmm. um i don't know why but i just was like let's fucking up our quality you know what i mean so sure. we'll see if it works it's like on a tripod up there but you can kind of see more of my background now um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a wide lens yeah it's a wide lens situation we've got going on um i went to the fall Out boy concert um and it was the best night of my life right um, oh my gosh did you wear your shirt uh no because i felt like i was a little bit made fun of by people <laughs> not really why I, well like i made a comment like my by sister, me my sister was like oh yeah it looks homemade or something and she was just trying to be supportive but it was like Oh no, now I'm paranoid, so I didn't wear it. I was um, gonna say, who do I gotta beat up? But it's your baby not my sister. sister, please. <laughs> she is not a minor anymore, so there's that. So that's okay. But mm. uh still she's my sister. Um, but look at my do you wanna see my Fall Boy manicure? Remember how I told you I'm I have all these new pa- passions or hobbies? Yes, yes, I'm familiar with your passions. Um those are amazing. I like your little oh, the thumb's my favorite. The thumb. I don't know what it is though. What is it? It's like they're a symbol they have of like a smiley face that's half smiling and half not smiling. That does seem like your vibe entirely. <laughs> and then you got a little French tip and a star. Yeah, and a little like um hand drawn star and then like a little antler. Very cool. Is the antler does that mean something? It's like from sugar we're going down swinging. Hmm. Anyway, it was the best night of my life. I got recognized by so many people and it was horrifying because I was extremely intoxicated and I remember most of the encounters. And then the last one, I started yelling at this poor woman in her face. Don't tell Reddit that I'm drunk. And she was like, I won't. And I was like, don't worry. I'm fine. I hear how drunk I sound. Okay. And I can consciously understand. Like I was going on this crazy rant and my sister and Renee were like, can we leave? And I was like, I just need to tell her not to put it on Reddit. And she was like, I'm not putting, what are you, like, wow. what on Reddit? Someone's fears got, really came out. <laughs> it was like crazy town. It was like crazy town. Um, and I, like, I got photos of people and I'm like, every time it's like, you've been tagged. I'm like, uh oh, nothing's come up yet. But I'm like, oh God, you're going to see my one eye open. Like, oh, I'm I always... love Christine's one eye that doesn't know how to stay open. <laughs> oh, it's, she's eye. so confused, that little eye. She doesn't know I'm where she's like, going. She's like, can we go to bed, please? Um, <laughs> she's already in bed. I don't know what you're talking about. She's tucked in. <laughs> she's down for the count. Um, but anyway, it was the best night of my life. And Renee came down from Cleveland and my sister went with her boyfriend. It was just so fun and amazing. And um, I'm in love with Patrick Sump all over again. It's wow. not. News. I'm sorry. It's not I'm news. so surprised. Yeah, right. I know. <laughs> um, but then the next day I was like, oh, I have an appointment at my GI doctor. And I went in and they were like, we need an emergency colonoscopy on you stat. And so literally in two days, I have to get a freaking camera up my butt. Yeah, again. <sighs> again. Your butt is getting like, so familiar with cameras. It's getting a lot of action, you know. She's um, got a lot of FaceTime. I wonder if her camera's in 4K. Oh, my God. Actually, maybe. I have I photos. I hope so. I medically hope so. I have photos, but they're of not your- pleasant. Of your tushy? Of the inside, yeah. Can I see? Yeah, <laughs> Is that but, weird? Yeah. No, I think mean, I've shown them to you before. <laughs> I'm pretty sure because they were in Los Feliz with me and I think I showed you once. Because <laughs> you were the only one who offered to see them. And I was like, thank you. I... Here's my here's my ulcers. <laughs> <laughs> not to be like gross about it, but I do want to know, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, I wanted to know. I thought it was interesting. I would see your in- intestines if I... Thank if you. I, if I was offered. One uh, one day you will be offered. Just when give it like time. Six, 45, 50, 60, whatever the like recommended age is. I'm supposed uh, to get them now every two years oh, for the rest Christine. of my life. Two years? Every, every two years? Yeah. And I got my last one pre-COVID. So they're like, you are late on this. And like oh, you, no. we got to get moving. And tomorrow I start, went to Walgreens, picked up my prep. And it's like this big of all this powder. And they Ugh. were like, you have to wake up at 1.30 a.m. and drink it. Yeah, you're going to be, I mean, I know you're going to be miserable and you know that because you've done this before, but I Ugh. still feel so bad for you. Well, thank you. Today I'm um, drinking a cherry Coke, a black cherry cane sugar soda because tomorrow, starting tomorrow, I can't drink anything with red dye in it. So, they so don't you're going blood. full red today. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm just like eating red, which I'm pretty sure I'm also red 40 allergic to, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> like Jeez. I get rashes a little bit when I eat a lot of red dye. Okay. Well, we'll but find out tonight. Bit. If that happens, um, anyway, I'm sorry. I've talked talked so much. How are you? Mm. I miss you. I miss you. I have, when have when did I last see? A you? long time. It feels. No. When did I last see you in person? Like an, like half a thousand years ago? What? How? When yeah. Did that... I mean, I can't even recall. Ah, I miss your body in the same room as my body. You know what I mean? I know that. I think that also is a fallout boy line you've been speaking in a lot of really mysterious terms i'm ch- I'm trying to channel whatever love language you need you know <laughs> oh my um, god that is the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me <laughs> looking at I'm, my pictures of my intestines i just and... i'm trying to create like faux fallout boy ai generated lyrics and look at your butt <gasps> that's, that's it. so good you're so good at it I oh know. there actually is a fallout boy line um it's called uh you're inside x-ray or like an x-ray of your insides or something so it really does seem like well, you maybe know they know that. they're on to something yeah yeah um how am i um here and there i'm really the main thing i will <laughs> evade more medical talk for once in everyone's life um uh, uh i've had uh, a lot of friends come into town recently which has been very lovely but i'm also i think i'm just a little socially burnt out now oh, i yeah. think i had I think it's when we're recording this, it's mid July and I really haven't not had a social thing happen for a while. Um, I've whatever. I don't even know if I said that the right way. I know. But I've had, um, like I went to, you know, we had RJ's wedding. My mom came into town immediately after that. Then my friends came into town immediately after that. I just had more friends come into town. And then next week or two weeks from now, I'm heading home to be with hometown friends. I just I just want to take a nap and have no one talk to me ever again. You know, honestly, <laughs> will it be nice to be home, though? Because you can like actually just like hovel yourself into your childhood kind of. home. Or is it like too social there, too? No, it's definitely not too social there. I actually I revert get... to childhood when I go to my mom's house and I just lay under a blanket and I'm like, I'm hungry. I also revert to childhood. But the problem with that is I have I think my biggest I have many flaws, to be clear. One you have of my, one and only flaw. Let's all my, be real. My my least favorite flaw about myself is that I am nostalgic to a fault. And yeah, oh, I, I do know that about you for sure. And I hurt my own feelings a lot when I go home because in my Aww. mind, going home, the only times I've ever gone home were for like a college break or something. And so every time I go home, part of me is like real bummed that like... First of all, half my friends don't even live there anymore. And the ones that do have to work. And I'm like, down so you're to party. like, it's not I'm the like, same. Yeah. So I get all, all hurt that I'm like driving through my hometown and no one wants to play with me. Oh my God. So, I'm always like, I don't want to tell. Well, I live here now. But before I'd be like, I don't want to tell anyone I'm coming home so that I can just sleep for many yeah, days. I, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I wonder how it's going to be this time. Maybe that's I am. my biggest flaw. Well, it's not the biggest, but it's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> quick this whole episode will be us just listing our flaws it'll it's be never four gonna be quick. hours it's long. gonna be so, i was gonna say you said quick that is the wrong word um i it i think this time around maybe i'll be happy with the fact that people have to work and mm-hmm. can't play with me because i'm socially burnt out as i said but usually going home i'm i'm so happy to be home but part of me is always a little sad because i just it makes me like miss the good times about being yeah. a teenager so well that's fair yeah, I'm very lucky. I very much loved my hometown and my childhood. That is, and so that's really And I great. still have my childhood bed. And so it's it's whenever I go there, everything feels like I'm 17 again, including my fucking attitude when my mom's in the room, by the way. That's like, what I, I'm saying. 
That's what Oof. I'm saying. I'm already. But I apologize real. now, Mom, for my behavior because it's going to be crazy. <laughs> they love it. They're like, no, we don't. We actually. I, really I know hate she it. hates it, but as soon as I'm gone, and maybe she wishes I one more what I'm day. I'm saying, of like, maybe they just got to dig a little deeper and realize. What's, as a mom now, what is it like to know that one day Leona's just going to be like? you know have her moment where she's just a little hellish i don't know it's so weird because i'm like i can't even she'll still love you but she's gonna you know she's gonna be finding herself it's gonna be scary you know i'm a little scared because i'm like you know it's scary <laughs> like to have especially now with like the new parenting techniques or like the just you know shift in how we approach ch- children and our relationship with our children like i don't know I've, i'm worried because i'm like there's a I feel like there's an area to, to maintain of like f- independence and freedom, but also like keeping them safe. And I don't know. It seems like wild, wild west because it's like, yeah. well, we don't know what the internet will look like in 10, 15 years. Like the thought of that is mind boggling to me. Is everything yeah. AI? Is it not Fall Out Boy anymore? It's just R- M speaking in AI Fall Out Boy. <laughs> is it just like, a deep that's... fake of me as like Pete Wentz? <laughs> <laughs> that, now that, if that's the only thing on the internet, man, then... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Count me in. We have not even, you and I have never even really done our own friendship deep dive into AI yet. So the next time I see you, I'm going to get you good and high, maybe a little tipsy. Oh, it's going to be time. the M. You have no I'm idea. Sorry. Sometimes when I get excited, I really start shouting, but <laughs> I'm so excited. That is going to be, well, can I come to your hometown? Now I want to play. Yeah, you can. I'm well, oh, I, oh, I have to be there. I mean, I'm going to see you in 10 days, homie. Don't you have a show? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. I'm like, can I come to your hometown? You're like, I mean, you're contractually obligated to in <laughs> it's literally like you've 10 days. agreed to. So yeah. Yeah, um, DC, baby. So that means I have to get a plane ticket. Wow. Um <laughs> Wee. Wow. Worth that's it. okay. So that's the next thing on the docket after we record. Um I don't even have my plane ticket yet. Okay, so don't worry. Everyone, uh oh, one good I'll leave it on this tiny little thing. A good reason why I drank this week. By the way, I'm drinking some Starbies. I'm having an Arnie P. Little black tea lemonade. Little fl- what's that flower on it? I don't know. She just appeared. Is it a sticker? It's a sticker. They just put her that on. Is so cute. I didn't want to ask questions because I was afraid they'd take my sticker away. Um, <laughs> like, you can't have that. Who gave that to you? <laughs> it's like, whoa, I was looking for that. Um, <laughs> I was looking and- for my post-it note flower. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, having an Arnie P um on this monday and well it's sunday for others but monday to you and me and what why do i drink oh i in my (laughs) refrigerator christine yes have two caramel apples you do in Ah! july it's not even autumn yet i'm so naughty i'm i am so amped for you right now there's nothing that this person right here (laughs) loves more and a caramel apple. So plain, I know it. Plain. None of this nonsense with the with the dips oh my and God. the things. You know me. I'm like cover it in every conceivable condiment and item that you can. Oreo, nuts, Oof. granola. I don't care. Sprinkles. I no. I just want her just a good old slap some get caramel it? on her. Uh, I we went to so many. Uh, when my friend was in town, we just kind of went to a million different shops. Oh. We went to a candy shop, Ooh. and obviously, I was gonna say f- like it wasn't a harvest fair. It's too early no, for that. It's candy shop, but I beelined it to where I thought the candy apples might be. And I, and every I hate a candy apple. I like no, caramel not into apple. It. I don't know who eats a candy apple, but good for you. People from 1952 who are probably ghosts yes. now. Has to and by be. people, I mean like old people from 1952 who now don't exist anymore i don't know a person in my life who enjoys a candy apple maybe you are one of them we're gonna hear we're gonna listen megan can you put a poll on instagram and say caramel or candy apple and see what happens actually just put caramel or caramel because no one's gonna pick candy (laughs) i want to know how many sickos there are out there listening (laughs) (laughs) anyway not only do i have one i have a two and I'm so excited about it. Aww. And I'm good. I'm, oh, I'm, oh, I'm so excited. Oh, every time we fly, um, Eva and I, we fly out of uh, Burbank, obviously, yeah. when, we're, when we're touring. And every time we get a layover in Denver, I get so fucking thrilled because the Denver airport, the terminal that we always end up in for our layover, has the 
ch- the Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory, and they always have caramel apples. That's right. And every time we have a layover in Denver, I'm significantly <clears throat> happier after the tour because I had a caramel apple that week. Yeah, the chart is like bizarre. It's like roller coaster. But you also get to see that demonic horse and stuff, so it is a good time in the that, in That's Denver. the truth. Yeah. Anyway, did everyone enjoy those 15 minutes? Anyway. <laughs> Christine, the story I have is real silly. Oh, okay. Um, it's <laughs> what could it mean? What could it mean? It's just well, you'll understand what I mean with the silliness. <laughs> okay. So um this is kind of like a what's it called? Like a biopic of like when do when I do those episodes oh. about a person. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um This is also a bit of a deep dive on some interesting histories. So here today, for all of you, I am telling you the tale, the biopic of Franz Mesmer, (gasps) the father of mesmerizing. Yes. A.K.A. the father of hypnotism. Hypnosis. Oh, I'm okay. I'm buckled up. Sorry, I needed to swallow the rest of my cookie. <laughs> it's like, are you doing a, are you uh, conducting a mesmerizing symphony? you? Oh, you know what, oh, you know what I just saw. For, if anyone wasn't watching YouTube, those last few seconds made no sense. But I was doing a, a wave <laughs> thing with my like hands. Silence. <laughs> you know what? Um, I watched a TikTok recently where someone said, um, "My favorite thing about uh, older white women is when they're dancing, they look like they're casting a spell on the sky because they all do this." <laughs> You're 100% right. That's what I'm doing. Every time you call me Kermit, because you call me Kermit for my dance moves, what I'm really doing is conjuring some magic, you know? Conjuring. So how dare you? Yeah. Anyway, that was that's my tech talk of the day for everybody to go find. Um, what a fun scavenger hunt for you. Okay, so here is F- Franz, F-R-A-N-Z. Frank with mm-hmm. a Z? Franz? Okay. Yep. You would think I would know how to pronounce it, but I am terrified Every time I mispronounce something, so I'm just checking. Francisca, like my sister, Franz. Franz. So I am mispronouncing it. No, <laughs> you're not. You're just saying it in your own accent. In my silly dialect. Mm-hmm. So, first of all, before we get into it, let's discuss, discuss hypnosis, dear Christine. Have you let's. been hypnotized? Would you like to be hypnotized? And what would it be for? Or what no, would you like yes, done to you? Anything and everything. Okay. I would I, love to be hypnotized. I, I'm afraid I'm too like in like too like neurotic to be hypnotized. Like I feel like I would be overthinking it the whole time. I, I'm afraid that I would either fully be like the weakest link, easiest, easiest victim, or I would like be say victim, like this is some sort of like true crime. <laughs> like as I'm volunteering, probably yeah. in, my, in this in this world, I'm also volunteering for it, but I'm still a victim. Because I know <laughs> I'm imagining like at one of those shows where like they make oh, you do something that silly. Is kind of a victim. You're balking like a chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I either think I would totally be the easiest person to hypnotize, or it would just not work at all. Um That's but- my fear. I'm like, I feel like I would be overthinking it. But I really want to be hypnotized. I know that's part of it, right? Like, you're supposed to be, like, really on board. Um, both, of, both of my parents have been hypnotized. You know, we talked about that because I tried that hypnotherapy. But I don't think, like, I mean, I've already talked about it for the phone anxiety thing. But, like, the first hour was just, like, talk therapy. And it mm-hmm. didn't really get to the bottom of anything. And then the hypnotherapy part was, like, kind of rushed. And I don't think I actually was hypnotized. I was just mm. kind of laying there. So... I really, but I really want to, I want to do a past life regression. That's what I want to do. My mom has been hypnotized, uh, in like on stage for a, for a gimmick. So she, she was, would. Able, she was down for that. And then my dad was hypnotized to quit smoking and that worked. And the, um, and the water, right? Or the. Oh, my mom. Oh, you're right. She was hypnotized for, yeah. uh, I, I was, I, I think that was a Tony Robbins seminar. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god are you serious okay oh, because i've told you that woman loves anthony oh, robbins excuse oh, me I'm anthony f- i'm so sorry uh anthony uh, yeah no i because i remember you were saying like and then she had to carry a water bottle around with her for the rest of her life maybe she was hypnotized mom weigh in um i she it was because she was like one of those like crazed 90s moms who drank only diet coke exclusively right and so I guess they got her to 
feel like she constantly needs water and nothing else and now she like truly has a full-blown panic attack like if she doesn't slightly have water. flawed uh situation but yeah I yeah get it. it it worked in the end i guess i mean she doesn't yeah. really drink diet coke anymore but um and then my yeah my so if both of them can get hypnotized genetically i feel like maybe i am predisposed right? to also be like available to that you know i'm so curious like i really i really want do would you ever do like a past life regression yeah for sure do you believe that like believe that it would work like i don't know enough about it like what if i'm just like inventing stuff in my own head you know yeah i don't know enough about it but i would be down to try i would Um, love to do it we should do it wouldn't that be a fun like youtube series or something (laughs) yes every episode we just get hypnotized (laughs) to do something else yeah (laughs) i mean how fun (laughs) that would be very fun and prop i don't maybe problematic i have no idea i i feel like uh I feel like there's a lot of people out there who kind of guffaw at hypnosis, but there are a lot of people in today's world who see it as, which is, I think this is where I am currently. I, if there's more information I'm unaware of, then please check me. But, uh, the way I see it now is that it's just like another form of like guided meditation, Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Interesting. which which also wonder, makes me wonder if I would be good at it because I'm really not, I don't like guided meditation. I can't really get my, self to that headspace yeah it's hard i i struggle i try to meditate and i'm i'm i really struggle with it but i know i should be doing it more especially for like lucid dreaming and all that but um yeah i wonder because i mean i know they kind of talk you into like a aren't your like brain waves supposed to change i don't know you tell me about hypnosis i feel like i'm oh i'll tell you taken over <laughs> so fun fact one of the earliest references to hypnotism was in 3766 bc I like how I was like, BC or AD? And then yeah. I was like, wait, that year has not even <laughs> happened yet. Wow, um, that's pretty incredible, though. It was this sorcerer who apparently, I don't know, I guess he could tell anyone that he, I don't really understand. He stared <laughs> into the eyes of lions, multiple lions, not just one, mm. until they apparently fell under his influence and they would follow him around. And I'm like, I think they were following you around for a different reason. But um, you forgot that you had a sandwich in your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> You forgot that you're walking raw meat to them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are you are the sandwich, actually. Good point. Um, and also, I feel like in the year 3766 BC, you could probably just tell someone that story at a bar and it not be true. But whatever. Maybe, it's, maybe <laughs> it is. At a bar. At a tavern. Yeah. So uh, anyway, one of the earliest references we have. And hypnotism today is usually credited to a Dr. Franz Anton Mesmer. Mm. and he was born in 1734 almost 300 years ago and in 1759 when he's is that 25 um, yes sure at 25 he began studying medicine at the university of vienna so seven years later he publishes his thesis and it is called de planetarum influxu in corpus humanum Imagine having to write everything in Latin. You're like, it's already hard enough to write a book. Now I have to write it all in Latin. It's exhausting. I mean, I in 2023 it is. I don't know if that was just, if you just happen to just know it a I lot better. I have to like tell the AI to translate this to Latin and it like <laughs> takes like five minutes. It takes yeah. like such a pain in the ass. It's so, uh, apparent. it does trans, I have the translation for us, thank God. And it is thank God. the influence of the planets on the human body. Which oh, is cool. that's really cool. It's giving astrology or something oh, like for that. Sure. I'm so Franz thought that the moon and the planets influence our bodies, and thus, if they were influencing our bodies, they could impact mm-hmm. our health. I like that. See, yes, I'm with you. You don't to an extent. Don't, don't stray from that. Because okay. I know the way I was I said that you were about to back away. I'm also yeah. down with that. <laughs> I also am down with that. But this is where I feel like I have to give some sort of like almost like QAnon PSA of like uh-huh. the most insidious fringe Correct. beliefs yep. stem from something that's easy to swallow. And then it, it very gradually morphs that's into other things. such a wonderful way to put it. Yeah. I, yeah. Because and I currently, feel like there's, it's, it's a slippery slope. Not to, I feel like we say that so often, but it's a slippery slope. Like to say, oh, the planets influence our health. And then it's like, well, then you st- start to stray from science or medicine. And it's like, okay, now we're getting in a dangerous zone. So I, I like it to an extent in a theoretical way so far. 
And keep in mind, in the late 1700s, how much science and medicine was there that we still follow today to the T? So, like, just the leeches. Well, at least for me. Interesting you mentioned that because here we go. Uh, (laughs) uh, Franz thought that the moon and the planets influence our bodies and thus could impact our health. And it is a very old concept. I'm saying it as if he created this, but he was like, he wasn't blowing anyone's mind with this opinion sure. of his back then. Um, there were many earlier historians, doctors, philosophers who all thought the exact same thing that Franz did. Um, and in the medieval era, many people also thought that the position of celestial bodies affected not just your health, but this also included your behavior and your morals. Your whole, whole personality was based on the celestial bodies and their positions. Okay. This included Pliny the Elder, who said that I'm sorry, everybody, because the brain is the moistest organ in our body. Woof. Uh, Not the tongue? Fascinating. I guess not if you have dry mouth. I would have loved for you to be the one to raise your hand at his lecture. I would have been kicked out instantly. First of all, I'd be like, is she a woman and also a witch? But then also she keeps asking the dumbest questions. The best part is he could have like been sick that day and you could have gone up and like been his adjunct and you would have been a witch and he would have been respected. That's crazy. I know. So tragic how that happens. So Pliny the Elder was one of these people who thought, oh, the, the planets and the moon are affecting our personalities because... And an example of it is, since the brain is the moistest organ in our body, uh, it's somewhat like the it's somewhat like the tides. And so, if the moon affects the tides, it affects the, the tides That's of our body. That's always my argument. To be fair, Pliny, <laughs> I would have said the same thing because I've always said like, well, not the moist part. I've never said that. I swear <laughs> on my life, I've never said that. But I've always said like, well, the moon's like the tide, the moon and the tide are related, correlated. We're seventy percent water. No, it takes something. It, I, I was literally about to say, that makes perfect sense, because in my brain, it totally does. and it, In your moist, moist brain, it totally does. In my does. big, fat, moist, juicy brain, yes. Um, I So you are not alone in thinking that, and truly, centuries ago, people were thinking the same thing. Um, right. That our body is very much like the tides, and so the planets must affect that. Um, Franz was one of those people where he was like, I love this idea. Moon's plan is affecting our bodies. Tides, yes, I'm down. And he believed this included our bodily humors because just like how you said we're 70% liquid, the bodily humors, if people don't know what those are, they're the four fluids that the ancient Greeks swore by that controlled our body. Mm -hmm. And so if they're fluid and the tides are fluid, the moon must affect our humors. Right. Do you know anything about the humors? I know they're supposed to be in balance, and then they believe that sickness was when they came out of balance. Um, Mm -hmm. So I know there was, like, a lot of bloodletting and that kind of thing. Um, But I don't remember the... uh, Is it bile? Is that Mm -hmm. one of them? Yeah, I don't remember the other three, though. There was... So this was a theory of the ancient Greeks, the four bodily humors, especially Hippocrates. He was down with this. And the four humors, which humor originally meant fluid... Mm. And uh, just fun fact, as you said, if they were in perfect balance, we were healthy. If they were out of whack, then we were not healthy. Okay. Um, And each humor was connected not only to our health, but each one was connected to a personality trait of ours. So there was yellow bile, which made us choleric or irritable. There's blood, which is made you sanguine or positive, optimistic, happy. So it's like essentially anger and happiness. Then mm-hmm. there's phlegm, which is like easygoing and patient. And then black bile, which is melancholy or sadness. These are all such gross things. I mean, blood is blood, but the rest. Ooh. Phlegm is a real special <sighs> one. Nasty. Also, health wise, they each... uh were they all were associated with a different important organ of yours so blood was your heart phlegm was your brain yellow bile was your liver and black bile was your spleen so if any of your humors were out of whack it could do it could have something to do with that organ that was leading to sickness okay um also a side effect was if your personality changed if you had if you were more irritable you might have more yellow bile than normal or something like bile exactly uh and fun fact a lot of old playwriting 
had characters where if you look at them as archetypes, they were actually just one of the four humors of the time. So there was angry people, happy people, sad people, or like easygoing patient people. And the So like in the writer's room, you'd ask like, well, what is their motivation? And they'd be like, well, black bile. Yeah. (laughs) That's it. It's yeah. the motivation. <laughs> they're and, they're sad. Well, apparently a a lot of Shakespeare's writing, if you look at all of the characters, all the people who ever caused drama were always more irritable or choleric, and so they were mm. uh I guess they allegedly would have more yellow bile in their system compared okay. to other characters he wrote about. Which is such sure. a weird thought, but I, there was a whole article on like Shakespeare's character archetypes and the four bodily humors. It was very Man, interesting. That guy had a lot of stuff going on. And whoever wrote that article P- had a lot of time, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Uh these humors also dictated our personalities and our health and early doctors had to figure out which of our humors were out of whack so that they could treat it. So if you had too much of one or too little of one, it would cause illness and doctors had to balance your humors out to get you back to perfect health. And because humors were also labeled hot or cold at this time, uh, treatments would require the opposite to bring you back to homeostasis. So if you're, let's say your issue was blood, too much blood or not enough blood. Blood was seen as hot and moist. <laughs> Yum. Delicious. I like how uh, it was seen as that, but like it is that. Well, like so we, we do know that. Yeah. And what's interesting too, I do like this theory a lot. I don't fall for it totally, but I, I do uh, think it's like creative is that each of the humors also had to do with a different element so that we're all connected oh. in, the, in nature. So blood is hot and moist like air. Phlegm is okay. col- cold and moist like water. Yellow bile is hot and dry like fire, and black bile is cold and dry like earth. That's so interesting. I do, I like I I appreciate the kind of creativity there. I also I'm like, oh, that's an interesting way. If someone said that to me and I was stoned, I'd be like, you fucking figured it out, dude. For real, you're lucky I didn't take any gummies today because I would be like <laughs> probably making a big problem for us <laughs> PR wise. <laughs> I'd be like, actually, let's bring leeches back. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly i'm sober the more you say I don't leeches hate it. Say, okay <laughs> so an example of this of like how they would treat a, a humor based on you know it's defining characters melancholy was often seen as cold and dry so okay. doctors would prescribe a hot and moist treatment so a lot of times if you were melancholy your insides were cold and dry therefore you should have a hot and moist meal like a hot juicy steak Literally, beef was the cure to melancholy, oh, which can confirm. Nice. Yeah. Can confirm steak does not make me sad ever. So, um, Good point. this is also, as you've been saying, where we get bloodletting because if you had too much blood, it's, I don't know how leeches are the opposite of hot and moist, but all right, I guess they just Great suck the blood right it. out of you. Kind of cold and moist, I would imagine. So now, nowadays, this is all the four bodily humors is considered bunk science, but. It was, interestingly, the first time that doctors actually saw illness as having direct natural causes. Up until this point, doctors truly just diagnosed, like, things happening based on supernatural problems. Wow. That's hard to believe. It was in the, I guess, well... I don't I don't know the timeline here, but a lot of people in the world of bodily humor era, um, that was the game changer for doctors because they actually started listening to people when they said that they didn't feel good and they didn't just blame it on the like the cosmos. Yeah. I mean, that's true. Like, it sounds so ridiculous now, but you're right. Like the fact that they're even saying it has to do with your physical ailments and your physical imbalance like the, Yeah, that was probably a huge leap forward. It had to be because now people can try to figure out a way to solve it besides just pray over it or something, exactly. you know, um, or like burn them at the stake or something. Right. And the fine balance of um, this is just another last fun fact, because I was desperate to figure out why humor now means comedy. Great but point. The fine balance of humors and like the the way that they were at equilibrium in your unique body That determined the condition of your body and your mind. And that was, you know, it was based on how your humor sat inside of you. So 
it has over time gone from just the condition of your body and mind it has extended to your temporary state of body or mind and so your humor can change or you can have a moment of humor and so it was a it ends up being you're, like you're like in good humor if in you're in good humor your mind has I love that actually is in that area currently that's pretty cool so now there's your deep dive on the humors uh, in the 1700s, this concept of balancing humors was slowly kind of fading out of, you know, its big boom. Everyone was obsessed mm. with it until the 1700s. But Franz Mesmer is still obsessed with this idea. Um, he fully believed that people's health would be dependent on lunar cycles. He even mentioned this in his thesis. Um, he once said that there was a, quote, mutual influence between the heavenly bodies earth and animate bodies in a continuous fluid and fluid being a humor okay and so he thought that all these things were working together so if all of them were working together but if something disrupted one of them then everything else would go wrong and people would ultimately get sick does that make sense it does Okay, so in 1773 franz was practicing as a, a doctor now and he's treating this woman named miss Osterlein. Miss Osterlin, Osterlin, Osterlin. And she, in hindsight, most likely had some sort of like seizure disorder. Um, oh, shit. She was suffering from convulsions, fainting, throwing up, headaches, and apparently also had some mania and delirium. Mm. And Dr. Mesmer was determined to f figure out that her, or determined to prove that her body's connection to the universe had a block in it, a blockage, and that's what was causing this. Keep uh -huh. in mind, this was the 1700s, and bodily humors was has recently been all the right craze. So. Right, right, right. Gotcha. So what he's saying at the time didn't sound so bananas. I will say, like, I again, like, going off your kind of QAnon thing, like, I feel like I could almost see this in some new agey groups. Like, fully. Right? Like, there's a blockage spiritually that's causing your sickness, you know? Like, I can kind of see where today people might still lean I into can that a little bit fully see like going to get like my palm red and hearing that there's a blockage in the world and that's why i haven't blockage yeah something yeah yeah i remember when i was like diagnosed with crohn's and i was just so sick and like my aunts two of them that are a little bit woo woo new agey and kind of went off the deep end would like send me these books on like don't take medicine like how to fix your like, you're just not spiritually aligned. And first of all, it felt very victim blamey at the time. I was like mm -hmm. 18 and I or 19. And I was like, so you're saying like, stop taking medicine. Like, this is something you need to resolve mm -hmm. with your spiritual side. And I'm like, first of all, that's very accusatory. But also, that's really dangerous to be like disseminating that kind of thing. And how quickly that like it went from something that kind of made sense to you denying medicine, you know, like so Yeah, and saying like, "Oh, don't say it's your them. fault," you know. Yeah, it felt very uh targeted and like victim blamey. So I, I don't I, yeah, I, I so I do have a very kind of like personal like connection a, to that. Yes, like a personal irritation with that specifically. And this is where like for maybe the thousandth time I don't know if I've said it directly into the podcast, but to people willing to listen to me face to face also, like everyone's got their own brand of wackadoo beliefs. I've got mm -hmm. my own, like everyone's, sure. everyone thinks something that sounds crazy to other people. Totally. Me included. But the second that you start using it to define a medical situation or you're exploiting especially somebody. Especially someone else's medical situation. You especially. Know I mean? And when there's a power dynamic of i know something you don't know and like trying to guide them towards something that there isn't any hard facts on you know i just uh, this i'm about i'm trying to keep myself from getting on a tangent about like keep your beliefs to yourself if like something as serious as yeah yeah medicine like, don't force is them on people who you know especially i mean it really can be dangerous like if i just stopped taking medicine and started eating all these weird mushrooms they were sending me like well, there's a lot of people know. out there in today's world who think like, I don't need a doctor. I'm just going to pray that it goes well because mm -hmm. God wouldn't deny me. Or Yeah, that's God, true. God... There's also so many angles to it. Like, it's not always so like new age, like woo woo. Like it can be like very religious or yeah, there's a lot of angles to this that and, are kind and of I'm, scary. I'm not pointing my finger at any particular belief system in this, but it's it is 
the point of this is it can be very a very slippery slope and yep. it's i mean it goes as quickly as maybe if you believe in you know the cosmos and there's some power out there and celestial bodies and i mean you're listening to and that's why we drink probably at least 90 percent of you are have heard of astrology and have had a deep dive. look at my shirt gemini season it yeah. says <laughs> It yeah. literally says Gemini season. Someone made it for us. And to a lot of people, all of us who are down with astrology think that we're a little nutso. So, I mean, like, we've all got our thing, but it's just totally it, it's so dangerous and it can be so slippery. So I just give that caveat for no reason because I don't think anyone here is pulling a Dr. Mesmer. However, I'm just saying it anyway. Dr. Mesmer was working on this woman. She was having you know some convulsions which in today's world if he pulled the stunt it would be incredibly dangerous because she needed real help um mm-hmm. he j- he did truly think he was helping her and uh he thought oh well your body and your and the universe have a blockage and so i'm going to repair that for you i will create artificial tides to heal you because the, the tides in you are not getting access to the universe since there's a blockage so if i create the tides for you or manually kickstart them to read the universe maybe you will be healed does that okay. make sense sure i mean so as the, far as it can make sense yeah yeah so we're we're declining quickly okay so um, <laughs> <laughs> we're so, rapidly descending okay so he, it like all it took was two bullet points. Like we were on board, and now we're off board. Yeah, I had a feeling that might happen. Okay. So he is. He decides he's going to make artificial tides for her. He's going to put, you know, try to help help things move along nicely. So he puts a bunch of magnets all over her, oh um, because he says magnets are the natural conductors. Um, okay. And I don't know how. And I don't know the rest of the story, but it seems that although she felt some like burning or prickling or whatever, she was magically cured. Now, what I think happened is that she was not cured, but she probably went to a different fucking doctor and he never heard from her again. So he assumed that she was was like, she must to be living her life (laughs) and traveling the world. And she's like, no, I just needed a second opinion. Or like maybe she didn't have like a like a seizure for a while. And so it looked successful. You know, I don't know. But right. I'm going to take a shot in the dark, having never been in a room with this guy and guess that he didn't cure her. But okay. (laughs) Um, So Franz is now like, I mean his ego has ballooned he saved this woman right so he's like this is the golden Uh ticket this magnet (laughs) thing is working um (laughs) so through his research which by the way do your own research right he would really love the people who say that today love that love it he loves it through his research he claims that he could use magnets on non-metal elements and and what, what i mean is people fucking people oh Um, sure (laughs) he thought Uh i can do it uh on people i can heal animals i can even like make artificial tides in water with magnets which riddle me that okay um he called this animal magnetism this was opposed (laughs) this is opposed to mineral magnetism which is just fucking magnetism just how magnets work just how magnets work right a metal and a metal yeah so if it's not a metal and it's you know, a living, breathing creature is involved in that category. It is animal magnetism. Animal? Gotcha. Which is interesting because if he coined that term, then when I've heard people say raw animal magnetism, yes! what does that like, mean? Are we going to say, okay, but I just Googled it because I had that same thought. And there's a picture of like Mesmer and it says animal magnetism, a presumed intangible or mysterious force that is said to influence human beings so i wonder if it's like oh they have this like hypnotic draw almost like they can like charm you that's how holly defined michael scott so (laughs) oh that's right i mean i i well okay i mean i guess maybe he knew as much about science modern medicine as mesmer did back in the 1700s but yeah i mean i've heard the phrase and so fun fact this is where it comes from i guess that that force it's amazing is magnets or lust? You pick. Um, Amazing. So, or both. Or both. So he thinks he's discovered animal magnetism, and he can do this by putting magnets on someone's body as a conductor for their tides if they aren't working on their own. 
Well, soon he discovers that animal magnetism can be trained from within. So anyone can achieve animal magnetism. He, it's not just him. Anyone can learn this skill. So there he, is hope for me. There is hope. You could, you could figure out animal magnetism and be a healer. So don't look out. I, you and I are about to have an, a moment together that others are not going to understand. Oh. Um, and my heart is beating very fast. Tell me. So what this guy thought, it's an inside joke, everybody. And unfortunately, I cannot share it here. Okay. Um, so he believes that he's discovered animal magnetism and he anyone can learn to do this. So you can learn to control the magnet, the magnetic field within yourself. <gasps> <laughs> I was like, okay, there are several avenues this could be. Oh, quickly narrowing the possibility. Okay, ding, ding, ding. That was fast. Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. I would love to share it with you, but I, for, um, for reasons for outside of my person, control, safety reasons, for reasons outside of control, for privacy, but like, just trust us. Trust us. It's, I wish I could say something I can't. It's a doozy. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Let's just say I know somebody who might be of this mindset and. There's no need to go any further with that. That's yeah, all. Just trust trust us that it's an interesting <sighs> place to be. It's a lot. And it's, it's uh, yeah, okay. Moving on quickly oh from God. this. Um, let's just say someone I know and Frank Mesmer I think would be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like so far a lot of the phrasing and terminology and kind of... It gets worse, Christine. Wackadoo, wackadoo ideas. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Bring it on. It gets worse for Christine. Everybody else just like buckle up for the general, uh, you know, the doc, general weirdness, the general yeah. gist of this. But trust me, I wish I could say something. There's okay. layers here. So by controlling, he thought that anyone could learn this skill. And all you have to do is learn to control the, your magnetic field and the tides within you. And you can magnetize people with just your hands. Oh my effing god. So, did you know this before you did these notes? No, as I was reading this, I was really nervous to figure out how I was gonna say it. But it's a little bit startling to hear. There's there there's there's an I can't even do it. Okay. Um <laughs> so basically he had been using magnets up until this point. Now no magnets needed. He's learned how to do this just through the hands. So sure. um he of course masters this before anybody else and he begins healing patients with his hands to bring their tides to a balance you know for them uh he would also sometimes use a metal wand that i don't understand this part apparently it would like it, he would use it to like help him i guess his hands weren't enough but he would need Maybe this metal like wand ex- all of a sudden extra magnet just in case he use an extra tough patient <laughs> right yeah so if someone needed extra help on a certain ailment or body part he used or maybe metal- if they weren't like fully convinced he's like well let me get my magic wand and they're like oh you have a magic wand now i'm convinced it is interesting that nowadays magic is defined as mesmerizing and magicians use wands but i don't know if there's a connection there but it is intriguing i would argue yes with no basis in reality or fact okay cool uh so he if he ever needed extra help he would like i guess poke people with us i don't fucking understand (laughs) anyway this skill of essentially laying hands on somebody to heal them this was called mesmerizing them gotcha and that's where we get the the phrase mesmerizing everyone for good reason seemed iffy about this his own alma maters were not like supportive of this at all um other patients started turning on him one of them Mm. kicked one family of patients kicked him out of their house because he tried to restore their kids eyesight with his hands and I think they were like, this is too fucked up. And they just kicked him out. Because Kel Surprise, she couldn't see afterwards. So Yeah. Uh, good, good instinct there, ma- parents. Yeah, mom, dad, anyone. Yeah. So in 1778, he's divorced. What? And uh, he's also... <laughs> And he's also losing patience quickly. He's like, but look at all my magnets. <laughs> I don't even need them. Um, She's like, you can keep the magnets. I don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> so he's divorced and losing patience. And so I think he, I don't know if he's like a laughing stock or something, or maybe he just wants to start over. But he ends up heading to France. France fucking loves him. Oh, okay. 
patients lining out the door for no. him. No. And so now, of course, with this ego of his, I mean, describe a narcissist better, please. Um, he <laughs> is, he is now essentially thinking he's like this, like gift from God, you know, saving lives all around in yeah. ways that nobody else has ever been able to do before, and and anyone can learn it if they just listen. If they just listen. Um. So he started to he started trying to come up with new tactics that had never been done before. Um, including magnetizing water and then prescribing people to bathe in the water. Oh, now we're getting into some, it's seemingly like uh, uh-huh. uh, cure-all yes. situations. Apparently, and I don't know if this is like, if this was part of the prescription or if people were just like, he couldn't keep up with the patients coming through that he was just doing this in mass. Mm-hmm. But he started magnetizing water and prescribing baths and multiple patients would bathe it together. Oh, wow. So like a like a spa, like a one of <laughs> Honestly, those... if he had Zach Bagan's business acumen, he would have just created a fucking spa, right? A like sp- it would a full on spa. But no, he just prescribed like group baths and people would apparently touch their fingers together, then they would touch iron rods to parts of their bodies that were in pain or that had illness to them. And it would magnetize their bodies and bring their tides and their levels back to an equilibrium and heal them. Mm. At some point, I can't help explain this to you. Like, it's just becomes, it doesn't make a lo- enough sense for me to really help. devolve. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Except France could probably explain it to you very well, because these people are going nutso for this guy. <laughs> he even meets Marie Antoinette. He meets King Louis oh XVI. He's friends with Mozart. And soon, Franz is, uh, I mean, you can probably guess where this is heading, but eventually his clientele is almost exclusively young women. Um, oh, whoa. oh, okay. Yeah. Surprised well, and not surprised all at the same time. Yep. Animal magnetism is still this concept that's growing and growing, and it finds its way into the occult community, probably because it, it was fringe or, you know, I, I don't know, wayward people were, were interested in. Sure. In ways people weren't New totally ways following. Of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So people start talking about animal magnetism. They start doing write ups. And some say that uh, being mesmerized makes people react in a lot of ways. You can start laughing out of nowhere. You can start sneezing out of nowhere. You can start dancing out of nowhere. And so to be mesmerized and all of a sudden you you're doing all these things out of your control Mm. very quickly this leads to the beginnings of hypnosis right so like if you're mesmerized your body just reacts in ways you can't control the big one that circulated was that being mesmerized makes people fall asleep so oh i love that i mean that's what i do i do sleep hypnosis every night yeah (laughs) i whatever it is i do it every night i love it yeah i gotta say yeah (laughs) so in the 1780s other doctors are now magnetizing patients because it just took that whole nation by storm other doctors are trying whatever they can medically and keep in mind this is the 1780s this is like only a few decades ago they started like paying attention or a few few centuries ago maybe they finally started paying attention to like natural causes and ailments and the physical body being part of the problem they're like anything and everything is possible medically because they've only just started taking medicine seriously like in in terms of the physical body so they heard this one person has it all figured out so everyone's trying it so these other doctors are now magnetizing patients and from this magnetic trances become a thing there's here's the situation when you're in a magnetic trance let's pretend you're hmm let's pretend you're the one who's the doctor right sure that's easy for me to pretend okay (laughs) so you're the doctor you know in quotes obviously um but there's a doctor or a guy he is known as the master gross oh Oh. um And he's the person who knows how to do magnetic trances. He's the one who can make people fall into a deep sleep. Eventually, you're trained so well that you can fall into a deep sleep or you can have someone fall into a deep sleep with just one touch, similar to hypnotists today. Mm. And this deep sleep that you're putting someone in, 
When you put them in this deep sleep, it is a trance that they called being in crisis, which I'm always there. Wake me up. Wait. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> isn't this supposed to help me out of a crisis? So it's, it gets confusing, which is why I tried to like give you a, a role to like pay attention to. So if you're the master, your whole job is to put this other person in crisis, AKA sure. a deep sleep trance. Okay. Uh, the in crisis person is still mentally active, but their body is asleep, similar to being hypnotized today. And they can only be woken up by the master's voice. Easy enough. Cool. Now, even though that's essentially hypnotism today, this was one step kind of removed because the person that was in crisis was called a clairvoyant and a clairvoyant then is different than what a clairvoyant has seen sure. us today. So a clairvoyant was the person that you're hypnotizing, you're putting in crisis and they had a supernatural ability where while in a trance, they could see into bodies like a human x-ray. Okay. I'm, I know how cute on this sounds. I'm so sorry. Um, no, it does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we can all agree for sure. So master hypnotizes the clairvoyant who has this gift that when in trances can look into bodies and see what's wrong with them. So essentially it's like the nurse to the doctor. So, okay. So they're like the assistant almost the assistant. Like not to say a nurse is an assistant, but like they are in this scenario, yes, exactly. like the, the second in command to like, yes, be, exactly. Okay, got you. Got you. So if you were to put, me in crisis, which you do every fucking Sunday, by the way. I was going to say, um, <laughs> if I were. <laughs> okay, you're the master. I'm the clairvoyant. You've put me in a trance, and now I'm looking at the patient you have. And while I'm in a trance, I'm able to see, like, okay, so something's wrong with their heart. Something's wrong with their brain. Something's wow. wrong here. so you're, like, the vessel that, yes. like, can then tr communicate. The That's fascinating and bananas. So while in crisis, while I'm in crisis as the clairvoyant, you, the master, would have me go looking through your clientele of sick people. I'd run my hands over them to find their illness. And eventually you would wake me up, ask me what happened. We'd put a report together and you would treat the sick people accordingly. Wow. Um, and the clairvoyance, when they would wake up, they would say they couldn't remember anything. They were truly in a trance. Um, keep in mind, this feels really like a huge gimmick to me. I mean, obviously, in a way, but, like, I feel like if the clairvoyant doesn't even remember what they said, sure. how are they accurately reporting what they saw unless the doctor is just putting someone in a random trance, deciding on his own what's going on, and then wakes the clairvoyant and, up and goes, oh, you told me all this stuff. And feeding the, yeah, 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 yeah. That seems shady It's a really weird further explanation really weird power dynamic of like i'm letting you feel involved but i'm just deciding without having done anything or you having done anything what i'm yeah. gonna do with this patient it's just and like you're a not weird... really involved you're just like a tool for me so yeah it, it feels weird. like a weird extra step when like you could just say like it does i wonder why he didn't just well i mean maybe he really was getting them to say things well Otherwise, i don't see why he he would do it uh what time is it it's time to worry because um a oh, lot of God. a lot of sources say that Wait, the... my alarm hasn't gone off yet it goes <laughs> off every 20 minutes okay but so, don't worry i'm always ready to worry <laughs> sources say that the best clairvoyance were young women so chances are he was okay. you putting these women into trances or putting them into a deep sleep doing whatever he wanted Snapping his finger, waking them up and being like, you were such a big help, like Ugh. helping me determine what's wrong with my patients. So Oof. that could be another thing that happened. A little uncomfortable. Gotcha. At any rate, more and more doctors are becoming masters of this ability where they can put clairvoyance into trances to help them. They believe that this happens because their patients or their clairvoyance have a sixth sense in their solar plexus. And when we're in a trance and our usual senses are not activated, the solar plexus goes into hyperdrive and can see and hear things you normally can't. It's like the soul essentially becomes more active, I guess. And that's how you're able to see okay. things in a trance. Like or... Open a channel that you usually can't access. Exactly. Okay. So eventually... This whole concept spirals more and more, and doctors think that they can train their animal magnetism, not just to, it's kind of like they're cutting out the middleman now. So not only, originally they were um, 
putting clairvoyance into a trance. And then I think they realized that's one step too much. We're hiring extra people that we don't need. Snip, snip, snip. Cut the middleman out. I can actually just do this myself. And so I can put myself into, I don't know if it's essentially a trance, but you can train your animal magnetism to feel others' illnesses, essentially like an empathy skill. Okay. So, and I mean, I have to be honest here. Like, this is where I get a little like eek because like, this is I, where, well, specifically me, because I feel like I oh, have done, oh. have like studied Reiki and gotten like th- through, I think, three levels of certification. And so I know like this probably kind of goes into that. Like, oh, I can feel where the pain is and adjust it. Like, I can see where the problematic stuff can kind of start to. So I don't know. Maybe I'll do a little self analysis later and uh, think. Well, about here's it. my here's my favorite thing specifically about you because uh, I feel like oh, I love this segment. <laughs> <laughs> it happens okay. once a week, folks. Um, it happens like actually it happens like once a day. I was gonna say never, but then I was like, no, Em's always saying nice things about me. I feel like one of the least attractive qualities in the like um like spiritual industry or field or whatever or in the community is when i'm i want to learn more about something and i'm a willing volunteer and i go somewhere and i i am agreeing to a service right and i can tell right off the bat that it is not genuine or it is not authentic and people are exploiting me and yeah, my curiosity sure. one of my favorite things about you is anytime i've ever asked you to do reiki or akashic records for me you go on this like 20 minute tirade every time where you're like <laughs> i don't know if it's real whatever i'm telling you take it with a grain of salt okay, i'm trying I le- my okay. best that's and fair. I do, you're right. I do. And I, and when I do Reiki also, I always ask for permission and say, like, listen, oh, uh, this isn't meant to, like, medically heal you. I just, it's something I'm, I don't I'm know. I'm literally your best friend and you ask my permission, like, 10 lawyers are in the room. <laughs> like, you are so scared of anyone reading your intentions wrong. Uh, yes, and, that's exactly it. And yeah. so I think the difference, I think, just like how you said, like, there's levels to all of this where we mm-hmm. can see things going on in today's world happening mm-hmm, here mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i i fully am a believer that intent and uh Fair. and directness and are transparency like fully, to be full transparent enough yeah and to not Meanwhile, say oh forget medicine and science do this instead like i would never suggest someone do reiki and not follow up with their primary care or their doctor like that is not my intention no you know? i i mean I also, this is just like like a, a preferred interest, but if I am going to do any spiritual work with somebody, I love when they're, this, I, please understand how I'm saying this. I love when they have a chronic illness or like understand like there's, there's a need for true medicine on top of what we're doing. And there's, yes, yes. A, there's like a, an appreciation for, an appreciation, yes. For the, yeah. Not exactly. like, I love that you're chronically ill. Like, you know? Not like the closed mindedness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I appreciate that there's people out there who are, thinking like i am literally i have 10 doctor's appointments this week but yes let me definitely do an akashic reading because at the very end of the day it could be fun but yeah you know or 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 it could just be could be know. random i don't know Flip i think i think your your worries about being clumped in with them it is not worth okay i worry. appreciate that i appreciate that i yeah thank you um because these people are saying i will cure your blindness you know like oh, gosh it's, which like first of all you don't need you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to cure that like it's, it's yeah first of all yeah there's, there's a lot again layers 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 it, but for so many for so many people of this time especially in a time when let's get into it folks with the patriarchy and the power dynamic of a man who can only be a doctor a man telling you what's going on if you don't come back to him he's probably going to assume that it was just a success and he healed you and <laughs> On top of that, like you weren't allowed to, even today, women can't second guess men or authority in a lot of spaces. And so I feel like if a doctor looked at you and with enough confidence waved his hands and said, you're cured, a lot of people would believe it. And maybe it's the power of suggestion, maybe one in a thousand it actually works on. But, you know, it's anyway, I'm going off on my own tirade. Sorry. No, I'm I'm with your tangent. I just don't want to extend it in a whole nother direction. So keep my mouth shut. I, I'm trying to keep my mouth shut, and yet I am hosting a podcast right now. So it's very um, hard. It's very hard. <laughs> it's a, tough, a tough cookie. <laughs> anyway, doctors not like Christine in the spiritual realm. <laughs> uh, they're all 
now be deciding that they're empaths and they can which is hysterical to me that you know just like in such a power dominated space they're like oh now i'm an empath and i can I understand love when people decide they're empaths i think it's very fun <laughs> for everybody exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> So now they're like, we don't need the magnets. We don't need our hands. We don't need clairvoyance. All we have to do is just like sit with ourselves and we're empaths and we can just feel what's wrong with you. And if you can feel how your patients feel, then you can diagnose them more accurately. The irony. And Mm. this is apparently called doubling. So soon doctors said that they could go into trances. They could double without even touching somebody to, you know, make anyone fall asleep. No need for clairvoyance. Um, And they could just connect with another body's magnetic fields and tides and diagnose them immediately. So very astral vibes, right? Okay. Soon people are choosing to put themselves into trances to connect with others. And this morphs into medium work. So it's almost like the clairvoyant decided they were going to go get their own job. Um, Yeah. uh, There was one actually named Mademoiselle Gilbert Rochette. And she was able to go into her own magnetic sleeps where she would communicate with spirits and angels and all this and this again seems woo woo but how many people out there are mediums who can connect with spirits like and people i back and believe too by the way like i'm not saying mediums are woo woo but to your the point that you made earlier there are some people that just exploit the community so totally take it what you will animal magnetism stays popular throughout the 19th century and masters during this time uh, start writing out some best practices, finally. And <laughs> do you want to take a shot in the dark? Uh, what it takes to be a master who is able to be an empath and do trance work and heal people? You probably have to pay like um, 65 installments of nine ninety nine <laughs> <laughs> and get a mail-in certificate? I don't know. Uh, Correspondence m- school? Even better and even less surprising you have to be a man oh. you have to be 25 to 50 oh. uh you have to be in good health with oh. uh with can you believe it a lot of self-confidence <laughs> okay so i'm none of those things let's be clear <laughs> gotcha not one not a one so over time they start saying that uh it's a master's will that influences magnetic tides so now they're essentially god right like they're okay. doing deity work, it seems. One guy named Kluge, Kludge, uh, he starts looking into mesmerizing and even defines them by stages. So now there's stages of mesmerizing you can get as a patient. Um, okay. So stages one through three, I guess easy to hard, whatever. Um, those stages one through three are when you can influence a patient's tides and they will feel side effects of it, like uh, sweating, drowsiness. They'll maybe feel like their skin, like a little rash. Then there's stages four through six where patients will seem alert during okay. this, uh, during their doctor appointment, but they're essentially hypnotized. And this is called sleep wake when you look awake, but you're asleep. Okay. So you're like, Kind of like you hypnotize, hypnotize, like at, at a hypnosis show when everyone's sitting there and they look totally fine, but they've been hypnotized. They're look, they're acting weird. Okay. But they're acting a little odd. So to be able to sleep wake, it actually took a patient many sessions to master that skill. And it even it took even more time for them to be able to remember what happened while they were asleep. So it, it almost now feels like this like weird package you can get like a plan or something where it's like oh yeah, well if- they want to upgrade you like platinum level plan yeah it's like if you want to come in and we'll do like stage one you'll feel a little sleepy afterwards but you know we'll influence your magnetic tides and you'll feel a little sure. better or we can go to stage four through six and not only will you be seemingly awake but maybe one day you can even remember what happened to you Oh, and the, I mean, the expense, well, we do offer a payment plan. And can you really put a price on, And know, since we're in the States, the insurance is just not going to cover it. <laughs> oh, certainly not. What insurance? Let's start right. there. Okay. <laughs> so patients, uh, these patients who I guess if you, I don't think there actually was like a package, but in this metaphor we've got working on here, uh, if a patient was able to be mesmerized into stage four through six, where they are just like almost a seemingly fully you know a fully awake person like ascended to yeah they could also learn to stomach see huh 
which is when this is so weird. I don't what a weird thing. It's really devolving now where okay. stomach seeing, I don't even know how this helps you. There's not even a medical reason for this, but apparently you can like learn to stomach see, which means a doctor can put an item next to your stomach and with your eyes closed, you know what they put next to your stomach. So what the <gasps> fuck is that about? That's, can you imagine if I went to the doctor talking about my fucking heart condition and they were like, but your tummy knows that a deck of cards is sitting next to it, doesn't They're it? Like, like, let me see your tummy. <laughs> and what part am I holding up? I'd be like, get the um, fuck out of here. That is bizarre. I mean, okay, here's what I will say, which this is not in defense of this um, absolutely batshit crazy situation you're talking about. But I do know that there is quite a bit of gray matter in our guts that are... Uh, Oh, interesting. Link to our brain. Basically. Don't tell any of them that because they'll lose. Their I minds. know. I know. But apparently that's a real thing that um, there is gray matter in your uh, in your your insides. Um, interesting. That, the same as what's in our actual moist, moist brains. So our moist, moist tummies are also. They got like, a little thinking going on down there. They're so smart. That's how my you know tummy when they has say, like your gut, taste. like follow your gut, like that. There's actual oh. gray matter down there. I would love to see us like a like a re a research paper on like. No, I don't want anyone to be put in life threatening situations, but like, however, you could like replicate them having a gut feeling or something. Like, it would be so interesting to see if the gray matter is affected or the cause of that. Yeah, at all. you know, and I wonder. I feel like. Um, I feel like I need to look this up so because I don't want to like just be putting out like totally fake news. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's a real even thing if it's not real connection. Even if it's not real, this is something we should add to our um, table of contents for the next time we're in the room together and you're a little stony baloney. Totally. Talk about the brain <sighs> in my stomach. And then you can hold up a deck of cards. And then we but can use our stomachs and eat something. You know? Oh my god, that sandwich that we were talking about <laughs> earlier. I've been thinking about it this whole time. <laughs> well, apparently you could also stomach hear and uh, your stomach could hear what the master was whispering into your belly. Which, like, couldn't you just, like, hear? Anyway. Just hear what they were whispering. <laughs> that Whatever. makes you remind me of when I was pregnant and I'm like, don't fucking talk and to my stomach, you freaks. I talked to your tummy and there was nothing you could do about it. You did, but not like just strange men who are oh. 25 to 50, you know, like <laughs> stop talking to my child. Understood. I was like, yo, you definitely heard me say some shit to your kid. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and she heard wrote. it, too. She's still yeah. thinking about it. I know. That's why she like kind of gives me that like stank face whenever I show oh, up. She's, yeah. <laughs> she's oh, like, they, what are uh, you doing I, here? Well, to be fair, you were like demanding she get out right now. And um, yeah she well, didn't so yeah she's stubborn interesting couldn't get so, couldn't have gotten that from christine no way just quick <laughs> quick fact from a website that i have not vetted but is called micronutrient solutions um <laughs> that's either really useful or not at all or like totally fake yeah um but they are quoting a professor of biobehavioral sciences at the university of california um, who says the system is way too complicated to have evolved only to make sure things move out of your colon. A big part of our emotions are probably influenced by the nerves in our gut. And the mm. gut compromising, nope, well, it, mine is compromising myself and my health, <laughs> but the gut comprising the esophagus, stomach, and intestines is the only organ in the body that it has its own nervous system, allowing it to function independently from the brain. Known to scientists as the gut brain, it is made up of 100 million neurons on the wall of the small intestine and around the spinal cord. So there is like uh, some, you know, this lack of clarity on like what does it actually do and mean so maybe maybe we will get some studies in the coming decades but um Isn't i always crazy? thought that was so fascinating it's crazy in 2023 that our bodies are still a goddamn mystery in a lot of ways i mean think about it that moist brain of ours all we know is it's moist nobody's learned anything else about it ever yeah that's true and that's it f funky stuff well i know that i know that's not true guys i just apparently I feel like, I feel like being dramatic <laughs> I well, I was on board fully. Thank you. Uh, apparently, we can have stomach see and stomach here. I don't know how that helps at all. I don't know why doctors <laughs> are even teaching us to do that. Um, <laughs> but these talents ended up being 
later added to the line of gimmicks that fraudulent mediums would use on people because just uh-huh. like those other stories I've talked about where someone was lying in bed but they knew what happened three towns over you know right or they they could read an unsealed envelope it's the same Great kind of thing point. so okay um and I don't know if these patients like were in on the joke I have no idea how that worked all I I saw stomach seeing and stomach hearing and needed to address we it we needed so. to so this whole time mesmerism was was in um France and Germany until the 19th century but then it moved to Britain and the US and it continues to grow to a point where at one uh, at one point early on Boston had over 200 mesmerists in the city alone so it's like holy shit doctors are taking this thing and flying with it yeah and no the, shit the term hypnosis was originally created by James Braid it comes from the Greek word sleep, and it became a synonym for being mesmerized. Uh, and soon hypnotism was being tested in all fields of medicine. It was actually used during surgery during or it was used during surgery before anesthesia. And oh. somehow, somehow it actually worked sometimes, which is so freaky to me. Um, huh. Patients would have no pain or memory of an operation. I don't know how that fucking works. The power of suggestion, I guess. Or maybe there was one person who was just really sleepy. And like, I mean, the- maybe it was like, you know, that they talk about um, being able to, like, if you're put in a trance. Okay. And this is where I'm going to go off the wall even further, which I know none of us were expecting that we would take this even more off the wall <laughs> crazy than it okay. already is. Sure. But, you know, I have heard stories about people who have learned astral projection and are able to in instances of extreme pain like almost like leave their body like to to like leave the physical sensations behind and honestly i as i said both my parents have been hypnotized i don't know how and i not that i'm like the world's biggest skeptic at all and i'm actually much more of a a believer in this kind of stuff but i'm i'm aware that i have no idea how it works if it works or if i'm being completely duped but I'm not totally against the idea of just having an out of body experience or being able to tap yourself out of a bad situation. Or like putting, or... putting your yourself in like a, a brainwave state where you're like much more relaxed or much more. Yeah. I don't know. I think like I, I think hypnotism can change your your brainwave state so i don't know it's possible i mean in today's world if it's seen as like a guided meditation maybe these people just knew how to be really fucking like zen back then I like so I maybe could do that maybe someone just was really all about mindfulness before it was a thing and like just was able to tap out or like all i know is i fucking wish they taught me that before my stupid me? vein surgery i would have loved that. oh i was thinking about you when i heard that episode about the the woman who was able to do that because i was like Man, that would have been nice for him to figure out. It would have been so nice. And like the mm. girl who apparently slept through it before me, I'm like, were you uh, <laughs> maybe were you she was... mesmerized? <laughs> uh, maybe. So hypnotherapy is now uh, really only exclusively used in mental health fields. And even then it's still controversial. But uh, Freud loved hypnotherapy, if that gives you a non-ringing oh, well, endorsement. Well, uh, he particularly loved to use hypnotherapy on women dealing with hysteria so cool so there you have that so there we have it uh it also became used for bringing back old memories to process trauma and just to tie in another episode uh hypnotherapy was famously used in the barney and betty hill abduction case which was episode 49 dang episode 49 my lucky number did i do that on purpose Someone listen to episode 49 and tell me if that happened. Um, you let me know. I probably mentioned that it was my favorite number. It sounds to. like something I would have said. Today, it is sometimes used to relieve anxiety, depression, PTSD. As I said earlier, it's now more about mindfulness or um, meditating. Uh, it can also be used to stop addictive behaviors such as cigarettes or to try to start behaviors like dieting, which, again, is very controversial. And it is suggested that if you're going to use hypnotherapy for anything like dieting or things that could you know, be damaging to your body, um, it's best to improve your perception of your body versus having someone hypnotize you to do an action on your body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. So P- PSA fully. Like, we're not saying go get hypnotized and Hell do a crash no. diet. Um, and you know what? Maybe someone has done it out there and it's worked, but you know that's not my place to say. Doesn't doesn't seem like something we should endorse. 
People also use it for past life regressions, as Christine said earlier. And some people believe that self-hypnosis is possible and can bring us to other realms or to help us communicate with otherworldly beings, which we are both very pro-medium and uh, those who have the gift. I don't know if you have to go into a self-hypnosis, but... Apparently that's one way to do it. To, I'm telling you, I actually like that. I can kind of believe because I'm like, I know that if you go into a deep state of meditation, I mean, I believe that you can, <laughs> I mean, I probably sound so wackadoo, but I believe that you're, it's possible to reach your higher self or reach your spirit guides. So, I mean, I mean, I, there's I'm, parts of this that I'm kind of like, okay, I could get on board with that. I mean, there's a reason that we're friends. It's because our wackadoos uh, <laughs> yeah. see each other. But They see each other and they hold hands. I mean, I very much uh, am on board with you that I think, again, I this is, I I find myself labeling hypnosis or whatever, you know, trance work is as a type of mindfulness or um, a good intentional spiritual communication or in a trying to do like self-work on improving yourself or ascending in right, some way right, right. whatever it is i feel like if it's done with good intentions and you really are trying to respect the process of it and you're not exploiting people in the process yes fucking go for it like if it works absolutely. for you absolutely if you feel safe and it. comfortable and excited to try it why not you know and uh I don't have to tell anyone here because you're already listening to, and that's why we drink. I, <laughs> but if you would like to learn more about hypnosis, there are plenty of sources for you. Lots of books, lots of all sorts of good stuff. And if you have a, a hypnosis story you'd like to share, we would love to hear it. Oh, so wait, actually folks, if I would love to hear, yeah. Can we request that maybe for, yeah. um, not August 1st? Cause apparently we're recording that tomorrow. So that, certainly no won't, won't work <laughs> um but maybe for uh for september yeah um and it just if you would email us your hypnosis stories we would love to hear it and we'd love to hear how many of them are successful and how many of them are not and if you've got a hopefully i'd love to know also like what the experience story. is like or like if if you um if if it worked on you if you felt like it was effective for a certain reason i, um, I mean I, selfishly I also, i'd love to know i also do think that um hypnosis is I, I i've never had it done to me but i like to believe that it is a helpful tool in the world of processing trauma um and absolutely. so absolutely i've never i've never done with, it but a lot of people with the right have said, provider with the right provider i yes. will say not with a Dr. Frank Mesmer, um, or not like your YouTube. I mean, I know you. Right. I, I've done. I've done YouTube hit, like self hypnosis, which is pretty cool. Um, but I, didn't I will even say know like, that I was a thing. Oh my god! I've done a a self hypnosis past life regression, but I was about half an hour in, and I was like, I swear to God, Em, I was like in it, and then Geo started barking like crazy, and I don't think Ooh. like my heart like fell out of my into my but i was and so you, but you can just wake up out of it if scared. you need to. yeah i was so startled that i was like god damn it and now every time i want to do one i'm like geo's just gonna bark again and scare the absolute shit out of me so hmm. one day i'll do one but i've had friends who've done them on youtube like with with some success so you know i've had i've know. only known one person to do hypnosis as part of their trauma work and oh interesting and they said that it, it did help i don't think they I, I feel like m movies have really ruined our perception of what hypnosis looks like. Yeah. But it seems like they were just really relaxed and able to just kind of tap into things that they're usually building walls up to. And yes. Um, so it was, it, if it's helpful for you in that way too, I would, I'm not in endorsing it to like go do it, but if it feels like something you would be Agreed. interested in, in trying for yourself, then and I, it's available like, to you. I've been, I've been doing, um, some trauma work as well and the counselor i'm seeing uh did a hypno regression on me and i guess maybe that was hypnotherapy it was it was over zoom so i feel like it wasn't as like yeah intimate that yeah that intimate like that traditional like you're laying down and you know um but it was pretty uh insightful and i really feel like i was able to jump back to things that happened that a I didn't think were related, but it turns out like to this this thing I'm trying to work through, 
And then I was like, afterward, I was like, oh my God, like it never clicked that that thing that happened when I was 10, like has something to do with this Mm. current trauma. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it was really cool. So I I found that very effective. I didn't feel necessarily like I was like hypnotized, but maybe I was, I don't know. It was a hypno regression. I don't know what that is about, but, um, if you were also stuff I pulled up and I didn't really consciously remember it and I just said it out loud and then I, later I was like oh my god I completely had forgotten that ever even happened like so it was really cool yeah it was really cool it also if you happen to be someone who has like if you're on the other side if you're the hypnotist oh, yeah. I would love to oh, know please. if if I'm either mess something up or if there's more to it because I'd love to know if there's like levels to this like absolutely like, is there like a light hypnosis you can like test out before you like really agree to like a full in-depth situation like yeah is, is there like best practices that people should yeah. look for or try to follow yeah. I mean I'm I'm also like so intrigued by this topic but I'm like you where it's sort of like kind of new to to me I don't it's, know too much it's also I know we've talked about it already like like so we're blue in the face but it is also one of those topics where I have to hold a mirror up to myself from like I have a lot of particular beliefs and how quickly could I myself devolve into falling Absolutely. for some deeper prop more Absolutely. problematic stuff because if like when I started this topic I was like I'm fully fucking on board this is the of best course. thing I've ever even seen and I'm totally I mean hello like we're like all about the astrology we're all about the, the planets and the tides and and so all it took was one sentence for me to go oh like if I were a little less able to critically think it this could be a disaster for me so yeah anyway i um just another psa that please be careful out there and if you are someone who is practicing medicine on people and it is not a documented medicine or documented practice and others are maybe not a very proud of it or are scared of it or are unsure of it or they can't go for second opinions easily Maybe second guess if you should be doing it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or steering them in a certain direction. Um, Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, It's kind of a, it's a lot of of landmines to walk through, you know? It's like. It's a dangerous episode, everybody. I'm trying real hard over here to to make sure I'm making my points clear. We've definitely covered more, um, what do you call it? More, um loaded topics for sure but this definitely does kind of um kind of edge on onto the the, the scary q type yeah. stuff so maybe everyone so, do a little self-work and just make sure that we're in in tip-top shape when it comes to just analyzing what's around yeah us. yeah i think that's the best way to do it just keep your eyes open unless you're being hypnotized because then maybe you have to close them <laughs> i don't know how it works closed <laughs> Uh, anyway, please take me away before I get on my soapbox again, Christine. Um, that was a really good story. Thank you. I, that was really good. I like, I, when you said it at first, I was like, haven't you covered this? But like, no, I think we just talked about it on rituals a little bit, but like mm-hmm. never really delved into it. So I'm, I thought you did a great job. It was, uh, I, I don't think I've ever covered a hypnotist yet. I also would like to cover our favorite, Mr. Crentist, Creston, oh, whatever. Oh, Crentist. <laughs> Crentist, the, the great, dentist. The great. Creston. Kermit? Oh, Creston. Um, like, I really can't get it right. Um, Kremit. I, never mind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, it's starting to click that all of these sound way too it's similar. No. Creston, Crentist, Kermit, then Christine. And Kremit. Oh, wait, did he and say Kremit. that? And Kremit. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. I am very excited about this topic. Um, it is one that I've been ho- hoping to do for months, maybe years. And a couple months ago, Eva sent me an article on Medium. And I want to give it a shout out because, first of all, like I'm like every other embarrassing – I'm I'm like – every other millennial in the embarrassing way that sometimes I will like see a news article and I'll like kind of skim it and then be like, Oh, I read this article, you know? Okay. But this one, like I fucking read it. Like I sat there probably for 45 minutes to an hour and like really like dug into all the details. And it is an article on medium by, uh, Kyra Dempsey is the author. And, um, 
And so Kyra Dempsey is actually an analyzer of plane. Oh, I haven't even told you this topic yet, huh? Okay. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Okay, let me tell you what we're covering today. We are covering the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah. And okay, I'm so glad because I don't know enough about this. And it's one of those topics that I have always kind of smile and nodded with people and like hope that they just stop talking about it before yeah. I look like an idiot. Yeah. And it, it happened during a time we were probably we were like, I don't know, in college and grad college, school, like trying yeah. to work, trying to but like didn't have cable, didn't have nice internet. Like we were probably just out of the loop, you know, uh, at least that's what I tell myself. But it is something I'd always kind of known about on the periphery and always been really interested in. And so when Eva sent me this, she just like knows me so well. She's like, oh, I just read this interesting article. And I was like, I didn't text her back for like almost an hour. And then I was like, oh, my God, I just read the whole thing. I'm obsessed. And then I sent the article to our researcher and said, um, let's fucking cover this. Like, I I'm, I'm really amped about it. Um, and th the reason I brought up uh, Kyra Dempsey's Medium article, that's the one that I read. And uh, uh, according to her uh, bio on Medium, she is an analyzer of plane crashes. Holy crap. That's a very specific but important job. And can I mention, too, that, like, I didn't know that when I read this article, but I was like, damn, this person is doing the most in-depth and comprehensive and, like, able to understand for a layperson job at this article <laughs> and like of course now i'm looking at it, i'm like oh of course they they do this for a living like but that just adds more right. credence to this whole article I, I think she did like an incredible job so a lot of the information comes from that um but there have been like some documentaries and other things um i listened to a podcast called uh black box down which is just about true crime in the sky and i was like i can't listen Forget to more it. than one episode of that because i think i'm gonna freak myself the f out i was gonna say that's a bold move when all we do is fly right that's i know crazy i know and sometimes i do venture into that space when i'm feeling brave and then i'm like why am i doing this to myself i leave tomorrow brave or delusion brave is Which... the incorrect term and you are correct to call me on that so not brave <laughs> just like feeling um what's the word feeling um like cautious, throwing caution to the wind, like really just not thinking about the consequences. When you're in your hammering curtains to the wall era? That, yes. When I'm in my Justice for Leeches era, <laughs> <laughs> which I have entered um, and probably which I will remain. Uh, God, I'm, I just got used to you guys liking possums. Now I'm going to have to deal <laughs> with this shit. It never ends. Ah, okay. So let's get into it, Em. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 was a regularly scheduled international flight on a passenger Boeing airplane, specifically a Boeing 777-200ER. Now, a lot of this info, you know, has been broken down and, and kind of written to be understood by, like, the average, you know, non-aerospace expert. Uh, <laughs> like you? Like me and you. Uh, but I'm hoping just... I guess just let me know if you're like confused by anything the way it's written because I I, it, I hope it makes sense. But if it, if something's also, confusing, tell me. Thank you. I will. I also want to say then because I, without even knowing what you're about to say, mm -hmm. if you have to make that kind of claim, I know the mental gymnastics you've done in the last few days to figure it out for yourself was crazy. So oh. congratulations. Well, and thank I'm you. proud of you. No, you know, what's so funny is I was like, cause uh, our researcher Molly and did, you know, did like the, the main core set of notes. And of course, like I knew the story already because I was, I had read this article, but then I was like, I need to like reread this article just so that I can like, like today, just so I'm like really prepared and on it because it, it's been a few months since i read that article so uh medium has this thing on the app where they'll where you can listen to the article so i was mm. like running errands and listening to the article and i was like oh my god i was getting all fired up all over again um so yeah there and, and i will say it's probably because kyra dempsey is so good at being able to write it in an un easily understandable way but sure there is a lot of terminology and a lot of like moving parts so tell me if anything is confusing 
Okay, I will be calling myself a, an aerospace engineer at the end of this. And honestly, so I will sell you, sell you, I will sell you a certificate. I was going to say send it, but I'll probably sell it to you for a price, $9.99 <laughs> over the course of the next. <laughs> Highway robbery. Hang on a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, you'll deserve it. So in any case, this airplane, the 777-200ER, first flew for British Airways in 1997. There were 422 models of this plane built in total. It's considered a very reliable plane. It's a Boeing, you know, 777. We've heard of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. So airlines operated this model specifically for decades. As of 2021, there were 182 of these planes still active globally. 183 were in storage. 42 were no longer usable. Nine were scrapped. And six had crashed. Mm. So Malaysia Flight 370 was among those ill-fated six that crashed, presumably. Okay, sure. At 1241 a.m., this is where it all begins, on Saturday, March 8th, 2014, Flight 370 took off from Kuala Lumpur International Airport, and that is the capital city of Malaysia. Its destination was Beijing, capital airport in China. There were two flights every day on that route. So this is a very normal route for this plane Mm -hmm. to be taking. And the overall travel time would be about five hours and 34 minutes. So this is a red eye. There were 239 people on board. 227 passengers, two pilots, 10 other crew members, and then 31,517 pounds of cargo. I don't know how many pets, if any which also makes me upset. Sure. The plane taxied to the runway, took off without any issues, climbed to cruising altitude 35,000 feet. The cockpit remained in regular contact with the ground, letting them know they were at cruising altitude as expected. Um, In fact, the captain, uh, who we'll get into later, was so thorough, he actually repeated the routine calls um, to report the altitude twice to make sure all the info was to the right people. Essentially, everything was operating as usual for the first 40 minutes of the flight. However, at 1.07 a.m., like, it's upsetting to think about this, too, in the, in, in, like, putting yourself in their shoes, because you think, you know, the flight took off at uh, 12.41, so now at 1.07, they're, like, up up in the air, and I, I just imagine it's a red eye, people are, like, falling asleep and getting yeah. comfortable, and it, it like makes this all the more darker yeah 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 it just it makes it feel i have a bad habit or a good habit but sometimes a dangerous habit of like really putting myself in the shoes of whoever's whoever's story i'm covering and definitely you know it's good and bad also well that that time frame is really like right when people are starting to calm down from the jitters of travel yeah from the bumpy like everything's okay we're we're smooth we've plateaued like we're you know, hmm. lights are now off. You know, it, it, it's just, it makes it a little more, um, it hits home more. Mm-hmm. So 1.07 a.m., the plane's computer communication system sent a standard transmission that displayed the flight's path. And it was en route to China as planned with no deviations. At 1.19 a.m., uh, the plane MH370 was at the end of Malaysian airspace flying over the South China Sea. So the Kuala Lumpur Control Center initiated the transfer of control to the control center in Ho Chi Minh City, also called Saigon, depending on um, there's apparently a little bit of conflict over which of those terms is the appropriate term to use. Um, But from what, uh, you know, Molly and I could find there, it's debate it's hotly debated so i'll just you know say both for now um ho chi minh city also called saigon in vietnam and <clears throat> essentially what that means is they were flying from uh their malaysian airspace into vietnamese airspace so it's sort of like we're passing on the you know response crossing international Ye- boundaries exactly borders. so now it's basically theoretically uh vietnam's problem problem <laughs> yeah like responsibility okay. to to be in touch with this airplane. So Malaysian control radioed the cockpit as they were leaving Malaysian airspace and said, Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120.9, good night. The first officer on the plane, on the flight, responded, all right, good night, Malaysian 370. 
That would be the last words they ever heard from Mm. this flight. So at this point, tracking of the plane should have been transferred, like I said, from Malaysia-based controllers to Vietnamese controllers because it was now in Vietnamese airspace. But Mm MH370, even though they had just radioed goodnight back to Malaysia, never made contact with Ho Chi Minh. So one minute and 43 seconds after the goodnight comment, we're switching to new airspace at 1.20 a.m., the transponder on the plane went dead. One minute later? One minute and 43 seconds later. So something happened, we think, in those two minutes. In that something happened in those two minutes. Hmm. There would be no further communication from the plane. Air traffic controllers on the ground uh, follow the paths of every flight using radar, and each plane appears as a little blip on their screen, sort of like that classic look of a radio, of a, I'm sorry, of a radar, you know, where the blip is moving through and it's scanning. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Okay. So it shows the location, but that's it. Like the, the little blip doesn't say like flight xyz heading in this direction it's just a dot so like that's sure. that's how they can track it so controllers will know there's an aircraft they don't know who it is or where they're headed for more detailed information on a flight and its path controllers rely on planes transponders now a transponder it. essentially what i was gonna say and that's been turned off yes two so minutes. that is the thing that turned off right after they said a minute and 43 seconds after they said good night to malaysian air control okay So what a transponder does is it sends electronic messages which communicate a plane's flight number, altitude, speed, and where it's heading. So it's basically what you would imagine they radio back to be like, we're this many feet and we're this altitude, you know, just like the usual jargon that pilots, I imagine, would say to ground control. But but they basically just like one minute, 43 seconds later, just off the grid. No information. It just shut off. Yes. Okay. When the transponder went out, controllers on the ground lost access to all of that. They can't, they can't access where the plane is. They can't access the altitude, speed, where it's going. Mm. Essentially, Flight 370 could be flying at any speed, at any altitude, in any direction. And I know. It's, it's almost like they go dark, you know? And, that's, and that's, all, that's also like, I mean, I don't know anything about this stuff, but it seems like that's a massive risk to every plane in the sky now because there's just like a rogue. Fair point. Tr- like it's like if it were on the road, there's just like a random person driving maybe in the wrong direction on a highway. Yeah, and fair you don't point. And know. nobody knows. Yeah, 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 yeah. So alarm bells didn't go off right away. I think there was a little confusion. So Malaysian controllers assumed, as they had already said goodnight, that now the plane was in Vietnam range. And so it was Vietnam's job to pick up the communication. But when Ho Chi Minh didn't hear from the flight, you know, they continuously tried to get in contact knowing that this plane was supposed to be in their airspace, but they just could not hear anything. So according to protocol, Ho Chi Minh was supposed to reach out to Kuala Lumpur within five minutes of lost contact. But instead they tried to reach the plane for 18 minutes with no answer before they finally got in touch with Malaysia. Okay. So 19 minutes go by. They're getting no response. They finally contact Kuala Lumpur, who was like, let, let us check. They reached out to MH370 and also got zero response. So now is where panic ensues. because Sure, the plane could not even be in the sky at this point. Nobody knows where it is. Fear and confusion. Chaos. Kuala Lumpur contacts Malaysian Airlines Control Center, who reassured them, listen, don't worry, flight 370, we just checked, it's en route over Cambodia. But here's the first plot twist. This plane was not supposed to be flying over Cambodia or toward Cambodia. Oh, shit. Okay. Had nothing to do with Cambodia. What's more, Cambodia's capital, Phnom Penh, reported they had no information and had not spotted this plane. So there's all sorts of mix-ups happening here. Controllers had no idea what the Malaysian Airlines Control Center was even talking about or why they were saying, oh, don't worry, all's good. They're in Cambodia. It's like, why? And no, they're not. It didn't make any sense. But they have no transponder information. So there's no way to like double check this. 
And because they don't have a way to double check it, controllers instead start following the flight through a global air trafficking product called Flight Controller. Okay. So using Flight Controller, they were relieved to see that the flight was still in the air and on the original flight path to Beijing, where it was supposed to be going. Unfortunately, what they didn't realize until a little bit later is that Flight Controller, if a transponder goes out, it no longer shows the accurate location. It just shows the original predicted path. Oh, Does that make sense? Okay. So the transponder yeah. goes out. If the transponder's on and, and reacting with flight controller, they can map out where the plane is. If the transponder goes out, it'll just show you this is where it's supposed to be going, like the original flight path. On uh, Find My Friends, I turned Allison off one time when I was trying to test something. I turned, I unfriended her on Find My Friends while she was driving home. And when I went to go look at it a few days later, it still said she was on the highway <gasps> on the way home. Is it kind of like that? Where like, oh, the, she's not on Find My Friends anymore. She's off the grid, but it's it's still showing the original path. Yes, she it's sort of taking. like that, except it would have probably shown like, oh, she's she's making like if if Allison's phone went out and say she or, okay there's a stupid example but kind of going off that say allison is driving you're tracking her location to make sure like she gets home safely and halfway through uh her find my friends or her flight controller uh transponder her transponder goes out so she's no longer emitting like the signal of where she is it's as if your find my friends would just continue the path that she was supposed to be taking so oh, for, so it's like still in motion yeah so it's like showing the actual path yes it's like showing the plane on the predicted path even though gotcha. for all we know the plane is fucking in the ocean or like somewhere for all we know allison's it's car just, is not going she turned around and is going the other way but since the transponder sure. is off all you see is the predicted flight path so they have this like brief moment of like oh relief thank god it but, is on the but way then they but they realize it's like on its default is it's the like default it's just... is to show what should be happening but we don't have a uh-huh. transponder to confirm any of this so that Weird. was a very big disheartening moment when they were like oh, okay never mind so back to square one mm-hmm. at 3 30 a.m controllers were informed of this they that, that's when they kind of had to admit okay, we have absolutely no idea this plane, MH370, is officially lost, completely lost. So 15 minutes later, 3.45 a.m., the crisis director finally declares a code red emergency, which is an emergency that requires immediate response protocol. The control centers and Malaysia Airlines spent another two hours trying to contact the flight by radio and multiple satellite phone calls, which went unanswered. They were already at this point suspecting a crash, you know, because why else would they not be responding? But people, of course, continued to hope that maybe the communication systems went down. Yes. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, no, no. I I know someone out there is screaming that I won't just let you say the story. No, but I'm also very. By the way. Well, we're all here. Round of applause. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. And thank Um, you to Molly Ann. But definitely ask as many questions as um, possible. I feel like there are so many bizarre twists and turns. So we all know what happened with Ocean Gate, the submersible. And uh, (sighs) you know how when they were saying, like, only this many hours left until there's no action. Only this many hours Mm -hmm, left. mm -hmm. Did they have, was there any discussion like that when it came to, like, how long they could last fuel. in the sky yes fuel yes, yes. okay yes they okay. had like the amount of fuel and that definitely comes into play they did that's a great question they had the amount of fuel that um and how far they could like predict how far it could get depending on i mean the tough part is they don't know which direction it went but right it, right, it was right. not on course but they did they were able to say like by now this plane should have run out of gas or fuel so they are hoping you know like against all hope that this plane maybe the communication system went down and flight 370 would somehow land in beijing against all odds um so at 6 30 a.m like i imagine everyone's just peeing their pants in nervousness the flight is supposed to land in china does not appear everyone 
Everyone at Beijing airport is just like waiting to see like something comes out of the sky. Intensity. And you know, like people at the airport or at least the higher ups know about this. And mm-hmm. I'm assuming other people, most people don't because they haven't made a public announcement. So that must be like a bizarrely tense day yeah. at that airport. Especially this was 2014. And I feel like if you're at an airport after 2001 and mm-hmm. if you can feel tension in the air, all your feelers are up. Like, Sometimes what I the see, fuck is going on? Yeah, no, 100%. You, like, are hyper aware of, like, any anomaly in, like, a travel, on a travel day. And I've seen, like, situations where you see, like, kind of the air traffic people and the, I don't know who everybody is, but they're wearing uniforms and they're all speaking in hushed tones. And I'm like, is it yeah, at is an there airport something I should know? After 9-11, if I ever see a security guard looking nervous I at know. an airport... I'm not flying. It's a very day. scary like, thought. Home. It's a really scary thought. And so I'm I'm imagining there was high tension there at the Beijing airport, um, especially as the minutes ticked by and the plane did not land. Mm. This is when they really felt like, OK, something has gone terribly wrong. Malaysia officially launched a search and rescue operation near the plane's last known location, like the last time it had pinged over the South China Sea, thinking, you know, well, it had probably crashed here and we'll start searching. Then at 7.24 a.m., Malaysia Airlines had to make, and I feel terrible forever, had to step up and do this, a public announcement about the missing Mm. plane. And suddenly the news broke worldwide, creating just like, an international media storm and of course devastating the families of the 239 people who were expected to just land a couple hours later in china i can't imagine i can't the terror the full terror it really like this uh, plane topics like really get me uh it's for a lot of people a lot of people have flight anxiety about like will i deal with turbulence not will i go fucking missing seriously seriously it's it's a very scary thought so you know i understand if people are like nope not for me like i get it Mm. so things are looking pretty damn bleak several countries including the u.s sent boats and planes to the south china sea to aid in the search and they expected to find signs of the plane within hours or at the most a day or a couple days and fun fact when a plane crashes uh in the ocean especially such a big jet the bulk of the plane sinks deep underwater so what searchers do is they look for lightweight debris like seat cushions insulation life jackets sure. things that would obviously float to the surface and of course tragically bodies of victims who hadn't been strapped into their seats um, and these would float to the surface in uh, in a situation like a large plane crashing into the ocean. However, mm-hmm. search efforts can often be complicated by the amount of trash in the ocean. You know, you see like something floating and it's like fucking styrofoam. From that plane. Yeah. You know, it's just like us humans being complete assholes and just throwing plastic at the fish. Um But when searchers finally do find what they're looking for, if they do, uh, this is like more of just a hypothetical or like how how this usually works. Um, Mm -hmm. If they do find what they're looking for, the debris obviously will have floated away from the crash site. And so then I think this is so fascinating. They have to do basically mathematical calculations that involve the ocean currents to work their way backward in time to where the crash would have occurred. Can you imagine having that as like a bonus question at the end of a test? I would. Do you know that three times in this, I write parentheses. Is this what calculus is? Because like, I don't know what calculus (laughs) is, but like every time I read that, I'm like, oh, is that what? And so when they say, oh, you'll never use math in the real world. I'm like, somebody's doing it. Not me, but. Somebody used math to save lives or to try to save lives. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. To do very smart things. And there's more of this kind of like ingenious like new ways of trying to search and rescue that actually are now being implemented uh as protocol because of this crash so we'll definitely get into like how things have shifted um but so now they're looking for this plane in the south china sea and the hours are ticking by but there is no sign of flight 370 debris and so something is not adding up they're like well it is not here That evening, Malaysian Airlines Engineering Department contacted the CEO of the company with some startling new details. So the department had reviewed Flight 370's satellite communication information, and it turns out that at 2.39 a.m., 
Malaysian Airlines ground controllers had made a satellite phone call to the plane, and nobody answered the call, but the plane's satellite data unit registered the call, which means the plane was still in the air at the time of the call. Okay. And that was at 2.39? What time was it? 2.39. Now at 7.14 a.m., another satellite fault connected to the plane's satellite data data which meant the plane was still in the air 45 minutes after it was supposed to land in beijing and six hours after its communication went down and that couldn't be a fluke that couldn't be a no the satellite so how did pinged it that it was that it was they they called to the plane and the uh transmission was received they weren't they didn't communicate back um but the transmission was received which means it was still operating and and in the it had to be in the air for sure not just like I on the ground i believe so because i think because it's like a satellite like it's meant to track flying objects wow so i'm i'm quite sure uh this is confirmation that it was still in the air so what does that mean if it was for it it lasted an hour longer than it was supposed to in the sky like or- well i mean i think they all typically have more fuel Okay. in reserve you know like i don't think it's like they have the exact amount of fuel just to get from point a to point b in case sure. they have to reroute or something like that okay. um, but it was still shocking because they thought oh well this is probably just your i mean i hate to say cut and dry plane crash but like the systems went down and we can't find the plane presumably it crashed but no hours and hours later this thing is still in the air apparently yeah uh, so far i'm thinking like someone put it in autopilot and hijacked the plane or something or like that is a theory okay that is definitely a theory okay So more satellite data would continue to come to light. Uh, A satellite over the Indian Ocean that was operated by a British company. Oh, that's the other thing. There are a lot of like private companies that also have kind of satellites and things in the air that they can like volunteer their information. Like it's not governmental tracking, like federal tracking. It's more like specific private companies that have um, some sort of a satellite up there and they can you know, say, oh, we were able to ping the plane at this time. And so they did. They they offered up some information. The satellite contacted the flight. Oh, sorry. I didn't even finish this sentence. And so that's what they did. The satellite over the Indian Ocean, operated by a British company, had actually made contact with Flight 370 in the early morning. So the satellite contacted the flight with a series of signals called handshakes. And I'll Mm -hmm. just real quick, like, tell you what a handshake is. Basically, it's when the satellite recognizes the airplane in the air and, like, pings it, like, sends an electronic query. Okay. And the satellite will then tilt in a position to receive a response if the airplane sends a message back. But the flight never completed the handshake. They never sent a message back. It it. was sort of as if, like, picture, like, you're calling the plane over the phone and they're not answering, but you know Mm -hmm. it's there. So Sure. They pinged it like they're like, oh, okay. So with those handshakes, they can see right about or at least an area of where the plane could have been as it moved. Um, But again, there was no like conscious response from the plane. So uh, the plane was sending these signals called handshakes, right? And even though the plane... Should we address that you're in a different Oh, yeah. Sure. (laughs) Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Remember that time when Christine fell asleep mid podcast and uh, okay. we had to redo uh, the podcast the next day? <laughs> I didn't fall asleep. She didn't fall asleep. But after we recorded, by the way, we're now uh, the middle of this podcast is a different day. And we realized that there were more notes to, to go. So okay, here's what I did. I accidentally deleted like a page of notes somehow (laughs) and when i got to the end of my notes yesterday as we recorded the episode i was like oh shit i missed like a huge chunk of notes where are they so i went and found them and now we're recording them the day later Mm -hmm. so it's gonna skip from this to like us yesterday so there's just like one page (laughs) where these notes i'm so sorry we're in a bit of a this is a weird like glitch in the matrix we're just we're in the middle of two sets of the same like going fast forward then back again um and 
future us that you hear in a few minutes won't know that we're doing this. So it's kind of trippy. Um, and I apologize, but I was explaining to M about the handshakes that the uh, satellite was sending to the airplane. And essentially they send this, this handshake and the plane is supposed to respond, but it wasn't, it never picked up. Right. right However, right. the satellite could still see that flight 370 was on was flying every hour until 8 19 a.m until right. it went out of range so basically this plane is still in the air at 8 19 a.m and that means it was still in the air more than seven hours after takeoff and nearly two hours after it was supposed to arrive in china so in other words they were like starting the process to look for the wreckage before the plane had ever even gotten out of the air. Isn't that wild? Yeah. It makes you also wonder like, so how much, I mean, I know there was more fuel than I guess the jet truly needed, but how much fuel I would want to know the math of like how much fuel is there in total on this plane and how far can it get if it's now okay. exceeding its destination? You asked that yesterday. I was like, I'll let you know. And then I apparently deleted the entire bullet point, <laughs> but I have it right here. I'm still desperate for the information. Okay, good. I'm so glad. So I will tell you um, in like two bullet points. I don't believe this... you. <laughs> no, I will. I don't. Delete. Oops. Um, no. <laughs> Authorities began to suspect foul play, kind of like you did at first, right? Like they believed someone on board deliberately disabled some of the flight's communication systems because if the plane is still in the air but not responding like it seems intentional mm -hmm. so here you go em at takeoff the plane was equipped with one hundred and eight thousand two hundred pounds of jet fuel i don't even know what that means okay uh, well, you asked for this information i know, I know, I know, I know. okay the trip that was planned to beijing mm -hmm would consume an estimated 82,000 pounds of fuel. So this is, uh, I'm getting hives just thinking back to like math class. I don't like well, this Well, what was all, the original number? 108,000, 108,000. Okay, so that's like 20, well, and 18 then 82, plus 8 is 26. 000. 26 more? I don't know, Em. I think it's 26,000 more. Okay. I Like, I literally believe you. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now I feel like we're, now I'm nervous. 108,200, wait, shit. 108,200 oh. minus 82,000 is 26,200. You're so smart. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that is how much would be in reserve, 26,000 pounds of fuel. Okay. And that would be enough to travel, here you go, an estimated seven hours and 31 minutes total. Wow. And the original flight was scheduled for five hours and 34 minutes. So almost two hours more of sure. fuel is okay. on board. So it's weird because the plane had plenty of fuel to divert to multiple airports if there were an emergency. Mm -hmm. Like if, if something had gone wrong, they could have diverted to... It's not like they were stranded over the ocean with not enough fuel the whole time. Like they could have landed somewhere safely so mm -hmm. this is also why they thought maybe this was foul play okay. so now they're obviously thinking where the hell did it go if it's still in the air at 8 a.m so engineers worked out a way to estimate the flight's location using the satellite data every time the satellite sent a handshake the amount of time it took for the signal to reach the plane and like bounce back mm -hmm. they were able it's like genius they were able to use that to create like potential paths saying, you know, I don't know. It reminds me of like, if a train is traveling at this speed right, for right. this many miles, like, which I could never understand, but obviously much smarter people than I are on this. And uh, so they were able to kind of do this ingenious kind of hack where they saw how long the signal took and they were able to route multiple different potential uh, routes that this plane could have taken and it, it wasn't precise by any means but it was at least a good idea of the flight's path in relation to this satellite people who are into like aeronautics and like oh. that make that their job i don't think i've ever understood until now what maybe their job entails but like having to do math about oh. planes is crazy that is also like requires you to think of people's human lives at stake Ugh, like oh yeah. my gosh i remember my friend's dad had all these like textbooks about like airplane history of aviation and i would look at it and go like 
well, I'm not a I'm not a girl girly in STEM. I know that much, and I'm three. <laughs> like I figured that out early. I feel like um, it's very much. I mentioned this to you when it came out, but back at the last Spider Man movie, he and Spider Man def- defeats Doctor Strange because yeah. he uses math and like. Oh yeah. <laughs> And he says, like, you know what's cooler than magic? Math. And, like, I just knew that was going to be on, like, an educational poster somewhere. Every poster in every middle school. You know it. Like, yeah. You know it. Like, you know, Maybe like. I get my cricket machine out and start, like, profiting <laughs> off that, you know? <laughs> like, Marvel's going to sue me. <laughs> I just can't believe. Like, you know they said it. They planted that line to make it a promotional To merchandise poster. it. For yeah. sure to merchandise it. Yeah, I totally but anyway, agree. Spider-Man, if he were hearing the story, he'd be like, can't agree. Math saves lives. So he'd be like, I already figured out where they are with my spidey senses. Yeah. Um, so next they had to determine uh, which way the flight went because there were multiple options. And data showed it was moving away from the satellite. But of course, they didn't know in which direction. So using the information I told you about the plane's fuel load, they were able to rule out several possibilities and they were kind of like narrowing down the potential paths this plane could take. So this was apparently, and I mean, unsurprising to me, a groundbreaking method of searching. Um, A man named William Waldock, who is a professor of accident investigation, said, quote, in terms of search and rescue, they're probably going to have to rewrite the book after this. Like They are like totally re-engineering so to speak the entire way that they're doing search and rescue here yeah so in the end they determined that the flight either headed northwest crossing china and india into central asia over kazakhstan Mm -hmm. and the other possibility was that the flight veered southwest so on that route the plane would leave land completely and just fly over open ocean over the indian ocean Mm. which also doesn't make sense you know 25 different countries joined the search effort, and the northern route was ruled out because none of the countries that this path would have been on reported seeing any flights that matched in their airspace. Okay. So basically, searchers were like, this plane went out over the Indian Ocean. Like, we can pretty confidently say that. Searchers deployed 43 ships and 58 aircrafts to the only remaining possibility, the southern path over open ocean. This search area was vast. William Waldock told CBC News, if it really is out there in the Indian Ocean, they're going to need a lot more than that. A lot more than the 43 ships and 58 aircraft. So on land, family and friends of the passengers and crew, of course, could do nothing but wait and just be like in total anxiety and despair, I imagine. Um, Some of them were trying to hold on to hope, but others already began mourning at this point. It's horrible. On March 24th, which was 16 days after the flight vanished into thin air, an emergency meeting was called in Beijing to notify the victim's relatives that they had ended rescue efforts and they were calling it quits. Malaysia Prime Minister Naji Razak confirmed that Flight 370 was lost in the Indian Ocean, officially is what they were saying. The flight didn't have enough fuel to continue south, and it had no place to land on its route over water. And the Malaysian Airlines CEO said, we have to assume beyond all reasonable doubt that MH370 has been lost and none of those on board survived. Wow. So, of course, this became an international tragedy. Um, And I'm going to list real quick. The passengers on board were citizens of the following countries, Malaysia, Australia, Russia, New Zealand, China, France, the United States, Canada, India, Iran, Indonesia, Taiwan, Netherlands, and Ukraine. Jeez. Oh, my gosh. I have chills. And I don't know, again, the details on the ages, which I don't think I want to, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just it's it's horrific. The International Buddhist Organization Sushi sent teams to Malaysia and China to provide specialized emotional support to the victims' families, mm. which I thought was like that's beautiful, really beautiful. And you know, the world is in mourning uh, and like fear, but the search for the plane continued because they wanted to find this black box. And Flight 370 was equipped with two black boxes. One recorded data on how the plane was functioning and the other recorded noise in the cockpit, including pilots' conversations. Mm. 
So black boxes are equipped with battery-powered beacons that send out these sort of pings to indicate their location. And ships can use special sonar equipment to detect the sonic signals underwater because they essentially sink uh, when when the plane crashes sure. into water. The batteries would only last 30 days. And authorities were like, shit, we're running out of time. We're already 16 days into this search. We oh. don't have much time left. Yeah. So working against the clock. Malaysia, China, and Australia worked together to comb the immense area of sea. They picked up several pings on their sonar equipment, but and they, they were getting their hopes up. But it turns out that, oh, my God, this is like, I don't know. I don't want to like, I don't want to. It's just embarrassing, maybe, for them, I think, because it turns out the pings were coming from their own equipment. Back oh, my to God. Themselves. And I just imagine that oh. would be so devastating when you're like oh my god we're hearing something you know yeah and oh, i'm not gosh. saying like oh they did something wrong i have no idea but it must just have been so they're so probably wired that they got confused about disheartening like... yeah yeah who yeah who knows and there's multiple teams coming in with equipment so essentially it turned out these signals were false and were probably pinging on themselves which sucks because if you only have like 14 hours left and now you're like directing a whole hour days, of... but 14 so. days I feel like it's like wasted time now that like you've been yes. trying to find these other pings and it was you the whole time. It, it, it's almost like, oh, Oof. we've just concentrated our search in this one area thinking it was here. Turns out we could have spent that time, you know, searching more. Mm. Yeah, it's got to be really, really disheartening. So after, you know, the time passed, they basically ran out of hope uh, that they would ever locate the black boxes. So the only remaining option was to simply start looking for the wreckage underwater. So on October 6, 2014, authorities began to search along the path or the arc where the plane last flew before it was lost to the satellite. Okay. They searched over 74,000 square nautical miles of ocean floor. Holy no shit. Luck. This is a massive amount of space, and it's not even as much as they would have wanted to to be able to but the funds you know and the time just weren't there for that that's but still an to me that's an impressive amount of time a massive so. amount yeah no luck no luck nothing in 2015 locals on the island reunion which is east of madagascar found a piece of a boeing 77 in the sand during a beach cleanup now, authorities were able to use serial numbers printed on the metal to confirm that it was actually a piece of Flight 370. And this was essentially their confirmation that MH370 had gone down over the Indian Ocean. But they still found no sign of the actual plane or any of the people who wow. had been aboard it. So in January 2017, nearly three years since the incident, all three countries officially suspended their search. Mm. Meanwhile, uh, a man named Blaine Gibson, who is a former lawyer from Seattle who specializes in wreckage hunting, started his... Okay. I know. What a Tinder bio. <laughs> what, a, what a hobby. Okay. I like long walks on the beach looking for shrapnel of an airplane. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> so he started his own search along the coast of Southeast Africa, and he discovered 11 pieces of debris thought to belong to MH370. As of 2021, 33 pieces of washed up debris have been confirmed to be connected to that plane. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's definitely, I mean, obviously. It so they have at some found point. pieces. And I will say, like in the Black Box Down episode I listened to, um, the guy who hosts it is kind of an expert on these things. And he explained, like, they couldn't say 100% that this, uh, it was called a flapperon, and it's like a just a part of a, a plane and it had a number stenciled on it and it was from a Boeing 777 and they were able to say like odds are this is from the plane they can't say definitively 100 percent, but we're pretty sure that it's from the plane so in January of 2018 so this is years later now a private search and salvage company called Ocean Infinity launched its own search effort the company told the Malaysian government that they would conduct a search, but if they found nothing, they wouldn't require payment. But if they did find it, then the Malaysian government would pay them for their services. Okay. It's basically like a no find, no fee. Like, you know, those oh, lawyers that are fun. like, if you don't win, you don't pay. Or if we don't, if we don't win your case, you don't pay our yeah. fee. 
You know what I mean? And so the Malaysian government agreed, and this company, Ocean Infinity, spent six months and millions of dollars scouring underwater mountains and caverns with its cutting-edge submarines and sonar equipment. Unfortunately, they found nothing. And so they spent those millions and didn't get paid for it and didn't find anything. Hmm. Left with absolutely no physical information about the flight's final hours, investigators had to look elsewhere for answers. One odd detail of the incident was that according to phone data records, this, this creeps me out, the flight at one point was in, within range of a cell phone tower while what? it was like off the grid. That means if anything was wrong or if anyone suspected anything was wrong, why did no one make an attempt to make a phone call? Like, you know, on the plane when usually you're out of service, but like they crossed through areas where there was cell phone service. And you'd think like if you were in danger or you were, you knew Someone's something looking at was their phone wrong, or trying to send a message. Yeah. Yeah. That somebody would have sent something, but that did not happen. So the thought now is, were they incapacitated the whole yeah. flight or did they, or perhaps they had no idea they'd gone off course. And they were just, like, in the plane, like, chilling, sleeping. Yeah. So next interesting point. For most of its path south, Flight 370 flew in a straight line out to sea. But the initial turn it took to go off course. So basically, you can see when the flight is going on its intended course. Then all of a sudden, when it goes off course, it makes such a tight turn that this tight could... This tight turn could only be accomplished manually without autopilot by a very experienced pilot. Wow. Yeah. So now I'm starting to wonder, like, if they didn't get hijacked by, like, let's say, like an expert pilot that happened to be a passenger on board who... And a terrorist. (laughs) And a terrorist waits for everyone to either fall asleep or hurts everybody so they don't try to have access to their phones or anything, takes over the pilot... The the only other thought now is like was the pilot like a double agent or something and like just like the pilot knew what he was doing the entire time. Well, there's another theory. M. You're you're nailing it. Sorry, I feel like I'm, I'm spoiling no, you're things for the, you. No, you're saying the exact things that like are running through everyone's mind as they're discovering this because it's like, wait a second. So a pilot would have had to make this. It's not like some random person could have gotten a hold of the controls. I and mean, pulled it's this I'm, off. It could be seen as suspicious that that pilot was so anal about making sure every single thing was right and perfect. I thought that same thing. Like he mentioned all the altitude things twice, He's even meticulous. though it wasn't required. Yeah. Calculating. Yeah. And I wish I knew if that was his norm. Like, does he always right. say everything twice? Or like this time, was he like, just so you know, we are at this point. Right. Maybe he's just a good fucking pilot and a victim. And like, I exactly. Don't wanna... And that's why it's <laughs> also know. really messy and kind of icky because you're like, I don't want to make these assumptions i mean there's we don't know and so it's like but yeah we will definitely get into the pilot because there is some more very intriguing information Mm, okay so in flight simulations nobody was able to make the turn as quickly as mh370 had and if this turn would have taken place which it did the maneuver sets off alarms in the cockpit Mm. and Essentially, it turned so tightly that if it had tried to turn any tighter, the plane could have stalled and fell, fallen right out of the sky. Like, this Ooh. is an extremely dangerous move. Also, would uh, people like just be toppling out of their seats and yes. other people? Yes. Actually, mm. I will mention that as well. Like, if you weren't sort of strapped in, you would You're have gone flying and down, potentially, yeah. like, concussed or, or dead. Who knows? Mm-hmm. So, the real maneuver that this flight actually pulled off was extremely risky. And so it's like it, it it's like either something went terribly wrong and they were trying to like fix it. Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. maybe they took the turn because they were trying to avoid something it, or maybe it was like an intentional move by the pilot. Um one theory is paints the uh, pilot in a heroic light. So author Ian Higgins suggests perhaps a fire broke out in the cockpit, shattering the windscreen and causing rapid decompression. The cabin would have quickly lost oxygen. Uh, The passengers would have died. 
and the pilot who was potentially wearing his oxygen mask uh, but had no access to the controls because the fire had destroyed them uh, he knew he would have to land the plane but he didn't want to hurt anybody else so he turned toward the ocean to crash the plane mm. where they wouldn't hurt anyone and he would just go down with the ship so to speak down with the plane okay Okay. And that is a, you know, heroic thought. Like if he knew everyone else was dead and he was like, well, I don't want any more casualties. So I'm going to die along with the plane. You know, that is definitely heroic. Um, but the issue with that theory is that this fire would have had to start in a highly specific part of the cockpit to create this scenario. Okay. And this isn't something that has ever occurred in any Boeing 777. The plane was well-maintained, uh, had no former equipment issues that could have caused a fire that they knew of, um, and investigators even conducted experiments. Like, they would take replicas of the cargo that was on board to see, because they knew what was on board, and so they were, like, trying to see, like, if anything could have started this fire, and they could never replicate it. Mm. So that okay, theory so it's is, just, like... It's, yeah, really just not even likely at all. It's just a theory. It's, like, probably not, but... Yeah. It's possible, I guess. So about an hour after the flight stopped responding to any air control, there was a temporary loss of power in the satellite communication equipment. However, the power was restored at 2.25 a.m., and that's kind of how we know the plane continued to fly for roughly six more hours. Okay. So if some sudden catastrophe, like a fire or explosion, who knows what, had knocked out all of the plane's equipment, then why did the satellite equipment only turn off temporarily and then get turned back on? Right. And why? I'm f fully on board with a the hijack theory at this point. There's... Okay, interesting. Keep so that in far. Mind. Okay. Oh, okay. Shit. Never mind. So, <laughs> no, no, no. Keep it in mind. Because it's, it's a theory. It's definitely a theory. Okay. So Ian and others considered some other de decompression disaster that could have deprived the plane of oxygen. And like perhaps the pilots couldn't use their oxygen mask for some reason. And they would have gone into something called hypoxic confusion, which is like the loss of oxygen and, and you're kind of delusional and you... You're kind of getting like all gloopy. Yes. And you do things that you wouldn't normally do in your right state of mind. Okay. And so the thought is maybe they had flown off course in hypoxic confusion until they eventually died and then like just spiraled toward the ocean. But this theory would require one or both of the pilots to be so hypoxic that they couldn't think clearly, but still survived without this oxygen for two hours somehow oh okay right so the chances of that happening would be nearly zero like if they were running out of oxygen presumably they would not have lasted another two hours going like completely off course in confusion right. they either would have been unconscious or dead next okay. investigators considered terrorism or a hijacking of the plane mm -hmm. however no terrorist organization ever took credit for the incident uh which kind of makes a whole hijacking plot moot yeah yeah it's almost like well of course the first thought is someone hijacked the plane but then it's like but why, why? like no yeah for what nobody said oh we did this you know and that kind of is usually the point of a of a big act of terrorism like that so that kind of just didn't make sense they okay. did however do extensive background checks on every single passenger aboard the ship which i oh, thought was kind of interesting that's so smart it is so smart. It feels a little invasive if you're the family member. Yeah. But I get it, you know, if they're really trying to solve this thing. Uh, pretty much nothing suspicious came up. So there were two Iranian passengers who were flying with stolen passports. But after doing a little investigating, it turns out they were trying to make their way to Europe to seek asylum. Oh, God, that's so sad. Okay. Horrific. And they had no connections whatsoever to any criminal organizations. Obviously... I'm sure some really awful people had opinions anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And of course, you know, it's like a, a fake passport that's already like alarm bells. But it mm -hmm. turns out that they, they had a reason. Yeah. They dug into it and they ge legitimately were going to Europe to seek asylum. It was their ultimate uh, plan. There was 
another issue. Okay, so this is where we get back to the whole pilot uh, theory. Because Flight 370 had disappeared expertly. Like, creepily expertly. I mean, you saw how... Well, I'll get into it. But its communication went down at the exact moment ground control was transferring from Malaysian Airlines to Vietnam airspace. Mm -hmm. So it took longer to notice than it would have any other time if it were just flying through the same airspace. Yeah. Then we have that harrowing turn the plane took, which required extreme skill by an experienced pilot. Um, and it's amazing. The jet, it's like something uh, most pilots could not pull off. Like a Mission Impossible situation. Basically, yes. Next, the flight carefully towed the line on the border of Malaysia and Thailand. And one theory is that perhaps it was trying to stay off the radar of both of those countries. Oh, okay. Thai military controllers actually picked up the plane on their equipment, but they assumed Malaysia had it under control. And Malaysia, meanwhile, hadn't even noticed it because they thought, oh, well, they're in Vietnam by now, you know? So it was almost like this person knew how so to disappear. It had to be a, I mean, obviously it had to be a pilot originally for the turn, but to even understand like flight courses and flight plans. And how air control would work and how they would ping you, you know, to turn off all of the transponders right at that time. Yeah. And now I think I mentioned this later, but like the interesting thing too about uh, the, the satellite, remember how it turned back on? Yeah. One of the theories is that the pilot turned off all the equipment but didn't realize that the satellite would reboot and so there would be a trace of where they were and so so it was like the only hiccup in their plan yes it's almost like exactly it's almost like he turned off all the equipment so he wouldn't get traced or tracked not realizing that the satellite would turn back on and be pinged um so you know that's a theory i just want to be clear that's not that's just one theory of why this may have happened. So it's hard to believe that all of this, the turn, the, the you know, straddling the country lines, the borders, uh, turning off the equipment right at the right time. It's hard to believe that these are all sheer coincidences. So now investigators are turning their attention to the two pilots. So mm. we have two characters here. We have 53-year-old Zahari Ahmed Shah, and he was an extremely experienced pilot on Boeing 777s. Uh, He had 18,000 flight hours uh, under his belt, 8,600 of which were on this exact plane. Wow. So he was an expert on this plane. Then there was the first officer of the flight named Fariq Hamid, and he was 27 years old. And he had only had 39 hours of flight training on the 777, but this was actually the final flight before he would be officially cleared to be a pilot of this plane. Wow. So this was like his last like step before he could pilot this aircraft investigators were totally stumped when they looked into these guys because Farik, the first officer was 27 uh he was bubbly friendly he posted often on social media grinning ear to ear in different cockpits like he loved his job um he was actually engaged to a pilot he met at flight school um and he was like this close to becoming you know like the next pilot of this really big plane it, like so things were looking really up for him so it didn't seem likely that this was something he would have uh commandeered or he would have planned out for a nefarious purpose then there's 53 year old zahari who was reportedly happily married with two adult children and seemingly no issues in his personal life until they began to interview people who knew him more personally. Uh oh. Yes. So Zahari had been separated from his wife and living alone in their home. Uh, he had been having multiple emotional affairs with several women. He told friends that uh, between flights, he would just often pace around the empty rooms of his house. Oh. He slept with flight attendants and he obsessively followed two models on social media, like almost to the level of like cyber stalking them, (laughs) like pretty aggressively followed them. Um, Some people in his life believed he was suffering from severe clinical depression, especially after this separation. 
and people people were worried about him. He was described as a compassionate person and people were saying they were they were extremely worried about him and it was difficult to watch him go through this part of life. But flip side of that is, you know, people living a hard life going through a divorce, it doesn't necessarily mean you turn to mass murder, right? You know what I sure. mean? Like Sure. It's not totally fair to be like, must be him because his life's messy, you know, yeah. like I'm sure if you went into the personal details of everyone on that plane, there's probably a lot messier stuff. And statistically, it, he also wasn't the only one with clinical depression. So exactly, I, exactly. So it's a little it's it's sort of like he had the ability to pull this off and he had some conflict in his life. So it seems more likely that it was him at least than the first officer who sure was young and I don't know, didn't seem to be going through anything too tough. It's hard to say, mm -hmm. but then a Malaysian police report was leaked and it contained some more troubling news that pointed at Zahari. Uh oh, this report revealed that Sahari liked to play flight simulators, which is a very common thing among pilots to play these flight simulators and like, I don't know, plot out routes and like just either actually plot out routes or mess around. And, you know, so that in itself was not weird. And he would often upload the playthroughs to YouTube. Okay. But they found on his computer hidden in a systems file. That was almost like it wasn't with all the other clips. It was sort of hidden. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a flight simulation he had never uploaded. And the flight in that simulation followed a path eerily similar to the strange path that the MH370 had taken, including wow. that really aggressive turn. Well, ding, ding, ding. I know. So in the simulation, the plane took similar turns to the flight. He flew the plane straight into the Indian Ocean and terminated the flight near the arc where the real Flight 370 made its final ping to the satellite. So uh -huh. it was like hauntingly eerie to watch this. Now, so, I will ahead. say, I will say, I have taught, like, of course, I found this to be like, oh, my God, like shocking evidence. But, you know, reading several articles on this, watching, um, there's a docu-series as well. And I talked to, I forget if it was, it doesn't matter, but I think it was my brother and like he had done some deep dive into this too. And apparently like it's not that damning. Like it sounds really damning to a lay person, but apparently like this is not a, that weird of a thing to do. I don't know. I'm having a hard time like wrapping my mind about or around what are the odds that you would have this flight simulation plan and then sure it just happens to occur in real life yeah there is the possibility it is, is eerie possibility. also though but it is eerie either way you know um, it doesn't it doesn't help clear his name it does not <laughs> and it, it doesn't prove anything but it also doesn't help sure. his case yes, yes. that's that's a, honestly probably the best way to put it so this simulation, which he had never uploaded, um, he had pre-programmed it. Oh, excuse me. He had pre-programmed it in multiple short clips, essentially so he could skip ahead to different parts of the route. Like instead of having to play the entire multi-hour path, he could mm -hmm. like skip forward to like, I'm going to skip forward to the turn. I'm going to skip forward to going sure. in this direction. Um, it It almost seemed like he had made the simulation with like, a goal in mind like mm -hmm. almost practicing it so i was gonna say so do you think if if he's the one that we're looking for mm -hmm. um do you think he was planning or do you like could he have been doing the flight simulation and then like some of that you were saying like the like the lack of oxygen maybe he thought he was in a flight simulator and like recreating it like maybe was could he have yeah. thought could he have been on drugs or something and thought he was in his flight simulator and like trying to you know that's really interesting because i kind of had that same thought of like maybe he had done that so many times and then when something did happen he was like oh i can do this turn i've practiced it a million times mm -hmm. you know may like maybe it was like in his subconscious like if it wasn't something he had done and he was trying to it, yeah i don't know i don't know i mean to me it sounds pretty damning 
Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. I don't know. And that's just me. And I don't know. It would that require much. an explanation. That's for sure. I would like to know what the heck that was all about. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, Kyra Dempsey a plane crash analyzer uh, in her article for Medium that I mentioned earlier proposed a new theory. Now, um, this is where when I found out that Kyra was a, you know, plane, what did I say? (laughs) A flight crash analyst or something badass. Something really kick-ass. An analyzer of plane crashes. Yeah. So When I found that out, I was like, oh, okay, that lends a whole new sense of credibility to this theory that she's posing, because I assume she knows more than the average person about plane crashes for obvious reasons. So this is the theory that she proposed in her Medium article, like just a potential. She said, perhaps Zahari, the main pilot, told Farik, the first in command, to go take care of something in the cabin, sort of just like sending him on like a little quick errand, or maybe he waited for him to go to the bathroom. And once Freak left, Zahari locked him out of the cockpit, put on his oxygen mask, and then cut the plane's oxygen, lights, and communication equipment. Mm. The cabin in this case would rapidly depressurize, and Zahari would then have begun his violent two-minute turn off course. That's how uh-huh. long it's a two minute turn. That's how like Oof, that's aggressive this steep turn is. Deep turn. Yeah. I feel Eva's in my like motion sickness, like bubbling up. Yeah. Um, so anyone who wasn't buckled in, like Farik, for example, who would have been just running an errand out there or like in the bathroom, would mm-hmm. be violently thrown off their feet and out yeah. of their seats, like you had Probably mentioned earlier. Unconscious. Probably yeah serious injuries would have occurred well, especially with no oxygen like you're definitely gonna be unconscious including exactly. everyone who's flopping around back there if they weren't buckled in and the shocking thing too is like Farik, who's supposed to be in the cockpit his oxygen mask is in the cockpit so like hmm. he'd be cut from oxygen and yeah. would be thrown violently and he would not have had time to get to his oxygen mask plus he was locked out of the cockpit if this theory is true so that makes sense why no one would have been looking at their phone when they were by a cell phone tower a cell phone tower because they're all unconscious and then dead yep makes sense so presumably in this case Farik would be unconscious or dead by the time zahari finished turning the jet those two minutes and in another 10 minutes the passengers who had survived this dramatic violent turn and had gotten a hold of their oxygen masks their oxygen would have run out in 10 minutes Mm. Which is just, like, the scariest thing I've ever heard. Mm. Like, a plane full of 200-some people, like, all suffocating to death. I mean, it's horrific. It's horrific. (sighs) So, basically, this would assure to Zahari that everyone on board would be dead Mm -hmm. for the next step of this theoretical plan. Once everyone was dead, Zahari could then repressurize the plane and restore certain equipment. And that could have been when the satellite communication back came back on and he didn't realize that it had flipped on mm-hmm. because he okay. kept all the rest of the communication sure. lines down. So he may not have realized about the satellite. According to this theory, Zahari would have followed nearly the same path from his flight simulation until he was home free over the Indian Ocean, and eventually the plane would have just run out of fuel and crashed into the ocean. And that was... It would have been a a mass murder-suicide, is the theory. And, you know, that is such a big accusation to throw at someone who can't defend themselves and who, for all we know, tried to do the opposite and save people we don't know and so it's like a very tough line to walk because you know this is just a theory um and it's it's possible uh but for all we know it happened nothing like that it is the best theory someone has been able to come up with. i think it is the most sound sound yeah sound it's the worst as far as like just the tragedy of it but it's probably the most logically sound to me 
Yeah. So that being said, nothing is really certain without the crucial black box evidence from the flight. And if Sahari really were guilty of a murder-suicide plot, he probably would have, which I didn't know they could do this, pilots, but probably would have disabled the black box when he cut communication at 1.21 a.m. Yeah. I didn't even know you could do that either. I'm like, you got to fix that, folks. And I think they actually did do a lot of upgrades to the black box after after this specific incident. Mm. So in that case, the black boxes would still give us, even if we found them and listened, if he had turned them off with the communication equipment, we wouldn't even know. Like it wouldn't have even given us answers, which is yeah. also so frustrating. In the end, we learned some valuable lessons from the lost flight, or at least the, you know, airplane community did because black boxes are now required to have a 90 day battery life instead of 30 Oh wow! Uh, because originally they were 30 and they emit pings um so that if they fall into the ocean you have like 30 days to find the pings of the black boxes they are now required to have a 90 day battery life instead of 30 to to you know buy crucial time and search efforts the International Civil Aviation Organization also requires all planes built after 2021 to include independent tracking devices that signal the plane's location once every minute. Wow. I, which I'm like, wow, I'm shocked that didn't have exist before. Just like a, a GPS tracker on a plane. Yeah. That Isn't really that is. wild. Like, I, I feel like, like if you asked me. Renee has an air tag on her dog, you know? I feel like you, I mean, with Find My Friends, I have an air tag on Allison and she has one on me. So <laughs> I don't have one on you. And every time I ask, I'm rejected. So I, at this point, it's a it's a bit of a running get a gag for us, but uh, you it, are welcome. It's real, I'm glad it's funny for you because <laughs> I have Eva's, and I don't. You're have welcome yours. to have mine. I I don't care. I've shit. asked, so I'm obviously not welcome. And you have mine. You, no, I don't. Oh, it says you and Lisa Lampanelli can both see my location, but I can't see yours. I truly can't see your location at all. Oh, really? I have. Allison, oh, you know why? Mom. You know why? What? Because you saw me. You had my location for so long, and then I got so irritated that I deleted it. I was like, "Fine, Em. If I can't see where you are, you can't see where I am, which is at home always." Oh, okay. Well, so I deleted you, and I'm sorry. Glad to you know. You don't have to add me. It's 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 a big, it's a big ask. So I won't I won't do it. Um. In any case, hello, Gigi. Uh, where were we? Oh, so now planes have to signal their location every single minute, not just like on the hour a potential like satellite happens to see it. Hi, Leona. Oh. Can I see you for one minute? Sorry, oh. folks, but she climbed How all the way up baby? to see me. Do you want to wow. say something into the microphone? What do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> Can you say... <laughs> Can you say Mothman? Can you say... Can you say hello? Hello, Woof Woof. Hello, Woof Woof. <laughs> hello, Woof Woof. Can you say hello, Funkle M? Hello, Woof Woof. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> Say bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. We tried. I tried to get Mothman on the record, but next time. Um, we got, anyway. We got hello, woof woof. So Geo got uh, a hi. I didn't, but you know, it's okay. You got a hello, woof woof woof, because I think she didn't know how to say Funkle M. But I've gotten M out of her once in my life. And that that's was a, true. That was a I should have just said M. Maybe that's easier. I was trying not to respond so the camera would stay on you, but I it was very I think precious. with Zencaster now, I think they're um both side by side. Oh, perfect. Okay, well then but, I just looked like a tool. <laughs> no, but also she couldn't hear you because I have headphones on. So right, I don't right, think right. that uh it would have made a difference. It would have been me hearing oh, 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 oh and <laughs> would not have relayed to her. Um so I'm so sorry about the interruption. Uh, that was not... Leona's uh, podcast debut in, as quoted. You know, she Isn't can that be, beautiful? She yeah. can officially be quoted. And she basically said bye-bye. So she, she said hello, goodbye. She said hello that... to the dog, bye-bye to you, and 
that's all she wrote yep uh okay so we're almost done here i promise but um you know like i said now flights are pinging every minute which i think is great please keep track of where my plane is at all times uh flight data recorders black boxes should also stream which i love stream their information to ground control sites so they're not just like locked in the black box they can stream that information to to just like the internet just like general no no no, just to the flight to air control like to well, th- well, that's useful. It's a shame right? that wasn't a, a thing before. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, man, they really it took a lot for them to kind of figure that one out. I feel um, like if you, if it, at pub trivia, if they said, when was that available? I would have not said as of 2014. I would so have been like, like when the Wright I, brothers were like, hey, <laughs> we went up, up to the sky for two minutes. I Let's make ass- sure everyone knows where we are at all times. I would have assumed there was something at least since like the 90s you know you'd think or at least since since 2001 Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. saying so in any case uh flights at this point should not simply be able to vanish without being tracked um these black boxes also should stream their information to ground control sites and they should float these motherfuckers didn't float they didn't no they sunk to the bottom with the plane oh please i oh, please. literally would have never thought that they were anything other than buoyant i mean if the airplane seat is buoyant and you're supposed to wrap your arms around it you'd think the black box could do it too but what do i know i don't know so kind of end of the story is malaysia airlines flight 370 is still missing today um it has inspired countless conspiracy theories as you can imagine Mm -hmm. some people believe the plane flew into a wormhole and is trapped in limbo others say it was taken by aliens uh and blaine gibson you know the wreckage hobbyist or whatever he is who found that um Mm -hmm. flapper on on the beach So in his search for pieces of the plane, he actually started getting death threats from people who Ooh. felt like his discoveries were threatening their theories about like time warps and government <laughs> cover ups. And he wow. was like, yo, I'm just reporting what I find. OK, uh, of course, the tragedy also inspired pop culture. Uh, there's a TV show called Manifest. I don't know if you ever watched it. Nope. I started to watch it and I got so freaked out by the plane crash. It. It's not really a spoiler. It's kind of the whole point. Okay. Um, <laughs> that I guess it's not really a crash, but it's like a very. Okay. Let me just tell you. It's about a flight that goes missing for over five years. And oh when the God. plane reappears and lands at its destination, the crew and passengers don't realize any unnatural amount of time has passed. It's almost like oh. they like skipped forward. It's a really cool concept, I think um it's really international authorities don't know what to do with these people who have been gone for five years and their families have like been trying to move on and think they're gone and not to be that person not to be that person but it is uh identical to avengers when they blipped out of existence half the universe blipped out of existence for five years and now they're all coming back and having to like cope with their families (gasps) grieving for five years oh shit yeah see i mean similar concept and to be fair uh in a comic-con interview in 2018 the director said he actually thought up the plot years before the malaysia airlines incident but nobody cared about his pitch until years later when flight 370 made missing planes topical and mm-hmm. then they were like, oh, now we want to do this show. So yep. he's like, I promise I didn't write it like about the Malaysian Airlines incident. It was only then that like interest was sparked. Yeah, exactly. So until it's found, which hopefully it will be, the fate of Flight 370 will remain a mystery. And interestingly, just this March 2023, Ocean Infinity, that same company that did the no fine, no fee deal with the Malaysian government, Mm -hmm. they announced that they have new evidence that may actually lead to the plane's discovery. Now, yeah. So I'm like waiting. I'm so excited to find out what it is. Um, They didn't reveal any details, but the company does plan to bring this information to the Malaysian government for consideration. Um, And again, Ocean Infinity is doing their no fine, no fee deal. So if they fail to locate the flight, the government doesn't have to pay them a cent. Uh, And they kept their word on that in 2018. So they plan to keep their word on it now. And the Malaysian government restated that we'll, we'll only resume the search if they are presented with compelling new evidence of where the plane might be. 
Wow. Another quote unquote fun fact, uh, more of an M style fun fact, hmm. is that during the previous extensive search of the f- seafloor, which I didn't even get into because like it's there's just all these maps of where they search i mean one of the search areas was like the size of minnesota and it's like in the ocean like it's just so much it just seems like almost hopeless sometimes you know um so during the extensive search of the seafloor searchers actually discovered several shipwrecks from the 1800s that had never been found huh it's weird that that patch of water was just never explored before i mean it's i don't know literally out in the middle of nowhere like oh okay well that is very fun fun fact it is it's pretty wild so it's you know it's eerie to think like a hundred years ago 150 years ago these ships vanished without a trace which is like so tragic and traumatic to think like oh similar similar things happened back then not mm-hmm. on a plane, but, you know, the terror of being on a ship and knowing you're in the middle of nowhere and knowing you'll never be found. Um, but it makes you also think, like, if that occurred 150 years ago and we found it last year, I know. maybe could... in 100 years we find a plane, you know, or maybe in much Oof. less since our technology has advanced so much. Um, so, you know, it's possible. Uh, it's possible future generations or even our generation might discover Flight 370 and give a little bit of closure to the families of the victims. Because um, according to K.S. Narendran, whose wife was aboard the flight, quote, after all that has been done and said, we don't know what happened. We're in the same place as we were on March 8th, 2014. For all of us, finding answers remains a critical matter. Mm. So they're still living with qu- so many questions. I can't and, imagine. Uh, it's just, also, it's a really tragic story. To not have the closure to know, like, did they suffer? Were they scared? It, precisely. Like, part of you just prays that they were just sleeping because it was a red eye and, and they had no idea. Yep. And it just was like a, you know, snap of the finger and things went wrong and hopefully there wasn't suffering. But, you know, it's just like without knowing, you know, your mind goes so many places and part of me is like so i don't know if like the if it's part of me is toxic or stupid or just like ignorant to the size of the earth but in my mind i'm like it can't be that hard to find a fucking plane like it can't be that hard but then you say things like oh part of the ocean the size of minnesota is like in the one middle part. of like an expanse that's just and and by the way i think part of the reason it was so hard to find is because there were multiple possible paths it could have taken i mean it was a full radius of wherever it, ra- it was yeah, last they don't, found they don't yeah. know and then like when they did more calculations, they were like, actually, it could have gone even farther, but they didn't have the... F- and it's so expensive also oh, to yeah, do these kinds yeah. of searches. So, like, there's only so much money they're going to put toward it before they have to say, like, we're just wasting resources. Um, so, you know, there were actually protests when uh, the Malaysian government announced they were stopping the search and saying everybody oh. um, has perished is what we're assuming. And, you know, there were the families protested that for understandable reasons because they really wanted to know uh i mean i get it but i also definitely get why there were protests like i know i know i know it's a hard thing to be it's a hard thing to like fall fall on either side really i mean Um, i i can totally see why people would just want someone to not give up on them and their families and friends and especially when you're just like so desperate and it i feel like part part of it too is like there were so many searches that like it felt like any day now we could have it like that kind of hope. And then that like it's like what we talk about in cl- in cold cases where it's like you get a lead and it feels like finally there's hope and then it gets snatched away again. Mm-hmm. Um, it just feels like a. Uh, a really, really horrific thing for for the, the families involved, um, especially yeah. I mean, especially the pilot when they're like. Who knows, you know, what really happened, but to have all this speculation about like your dad yeah. or whatever being like this mass murderer and not really knowing. Um anyway, yeah. So it pr- pretty pretty dark stuff. Um Well, that I know it was sad, Christine, but that was that was a very good story. And not to like 
pat myself on the back here, but the Frank Mesmer story, I think that was one of my favorite topics to cover recently. And I think this was one of my favorite episodes we've done. This was a doozy. This was a good one. And I feel like very mysterious. A lot of questions that I'd love to hear from people on, which is always kind of fun. Um, I mean, most importantly, um, do you like candy apple or caramel? Because I need to weed (laughs) weed some of you out. But the rest of it, I feel quite, uh, quite good about. I feel like um, this is and, you know, I want to point out too, like I waffled on doing this story because it's not necessarily true crime. But I just love like the, you know, I don't love well, the mystery fact that it happened, but I just, I just, I'm so intrigued by the mystery of it and trying to figure out, you know, what what could have happened. So, well, and um, my my story was not paranormal, but you know what? Every now and then we like to branch out and just we see past lives a few times. That counts. How far can we make a story like paranormal, spooky adjacent? Yeah, you know, yeah, while, yeah. How with far the can we stretch still attached? that bu- bubble? <laughs> but uh, no, it was still a great episode and. Way to bookend it, Christine, because you just reminded me I have two caramel apples I need to attend to. So ah, excuse me, finally. everybody. What if Allison ate one? Just kidding. That's not. I'd a nice scream. Trip. I'd truly scream. So um, she wouldn't do that. She might because there's two, and she might think one is for her. So I actually have to go check on that. It's um, actually and... extremely upsetting. That's why <laughs> we drink. <laughs>